Buongiorno, cominciamo direi questa giornata che col permesso di Luigi vorrei reintitolare il suono del fagiano, visto che si parlerà in questo programma ricchissimo di tre giorni, sia del, diciamo ci sarà un poetry reading come ieri, ma si parlerà anche della traduzione o della traslazione della poesia da una lingua, da un suono, diciamo così, all'altro. Eh, e, e, e dunque per me è una giornata fondamentale perché eh, senza suono una poesia non esiste. È bello proprio per questo trovarci qui tutti assieme, non a, a leggere ma a parlare. Eh, voi che ascoltate il suono dei miei sospiri, Petrarca cominciava così e su quell'inizio Relli si è basato per un bellissimo libro eh, dove ha dato alla dimensione fonica della poesia eh, un'illustrazione splendida su cui anche vorrei ricordare un altro libro su cui ci siamo formati, almeno quelli della mia generazione, ha parlato molto bene anche Costanzo del Girolamo in teoria e prassi della versificazione. Il suono che è fatto non solamente di fonemi ma è fatto di intonazioni, insomma di quelli che si chiamano tratti soprasegmentali. E vorrei ringraziare a nome dell'Istituto di Cultura per il dono magnifico di questa giornata Stefano Albertini, eh, la Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò della eh, New York University, in particolare Julian Sachs e l'Associazione di Poesia anche col suo direttore Giovanni Bonoldi. Ma un applauso soprattutto va a Luigi Ballerini. che più che a un fagiano assomiglia alla Fenice, capace di incendiare il mondo e di rinascere tutti, coinvolgendo tutti, trascinando tutti, incantando tutti con il suo volo. Grazie Luigi e passo la parola a Cecilia Bello. Good morning and thanks to Luigi Pallerini, to Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò and the Istituto Italiano di Cultura for this invitation that I accepted with great pleasure. For several years now, the Italian culture scene has been experiencing a period of major reaction and regression and this also applies to the literary branch then also to poetry. The expansion of large publishing houses is crushing the small ones, which are often more curious and more virtuous, but objectively less incisive in terms of dissemination and marketing, or are forced to work harder to disseminate the books they print. Without endorsing the rhetoric of victimhood, The poetry that seems to me to have the most to gain is forced to spread on the margins of a system that has firmly acquired means and power in the more than mature capitalism, or in the more than mature globalization, or in the words of Mark Fisher in Capitalist Realism, which we can easily understand today by reflecting on the ontological shift of Margaret Thatcher's infamous statement, or doctrine, if you want, that there is no alternative. Back then, in 1989, the British Prime Minister meant there is no alternative to neoliberal capitalism because it is preferable to other systems. Today, capitalism, wrote Fisher, is not only the best possible system, as it then seemed to Thatcher, but also the only one. The alternatives are confused, ghostly, barely conceivable. 
Capitalist realism in Fisher perspective is like a pervasive atmosphere conditioning not only the production of culture but also the regulation of work and education and acting as a kind of invisible barrier constraining thought and action. However, it's not merely for market reasons that the more reader-friendly and more emotional and consolatory poetics are now dominant. Beyond the complaint about the publishing market, a complaint that, with, while correct and shareable, is so often and generally repeated as to appear empty, no one must consider that th those responsible for the reactionary trend are in part those who could and should have opposed it. Currently, the neo-avant-garde is studied less than other literary periods. In Italy, the, acad the academy seems to prefer pleasantly readable authors who do not have the stabilizing effects or who have already entered the literary canon. In several of our universities, courses, and thus essays on poets with an easily recognizable profile, such as Montale, Sereni, Giudici, Catroni, Bertolucci, and Bassani, flourish. Courses on the neo-avant-garde, not only in my faculty, seem to me very rare. I happened to hear a scholar, full professor, officially hired as an expert of contemporary Italian literature, whose studies focus on 19th century, stating that the neo-avant-garde has been, I quote faithfully, the absolute evil of, for our literature. While respecting aesthetic divergences, we cannot accept such a lack of historiographical perspective nor can we accommodate the curious tendency to forget what the five novissimi produced after the 60s, after 1969, I mean, official end of the neo-avant-garde. It is not uncommon for Italian scholars, though experts on the 20th century, to scotomize the neo-avant-garde as if it had never existed. Even some of them, when studying the 70s, take into consideration only those who began writing in that decade, such as Dario Bellezza or Milo De Andres. Removing or censoring the production of the Novissimi after the end of the neo avant Some of us, I must sadly express in these terms, are not afraid to almost completely overlook both the neo-avant-garde experience and the works of the Novissimi from the 70s onwards. I'm talking about forgetfulness and oblivion, not negative critical study and interpretation, nor documented literary historical profiles. Unfortunately, even some rather young scholars have embraced this tendency toward removal, both for the novissimi experience and of what, having disbanded the Gruppo 63, the novissimi continued to produce until the beginning of the 21st century, sometimes creating important and influencing poetic and narrative works. Instead, we must remember with appropriate space for analysis and just to give a you a hint that Balestrini's Ballate della Signorina Richmond appeared in the 70s, Sanguinetti's Virvar in 1972, Catamerone in 1974, Postcarte in 1978, and Alfabeto Apocalyptico, Novissimum Testamentum and Bisbidis in the 80s, and so on. With the exception of Antonio Porta, who in the 70s underwent a clear conversion to a more communicative poetic dictation, I will choose the voice, is one of his new assumptions, and then died prematurely, the other four novissimi, Sanguinetti, Balestrini, Pagliarani and Giuliani, continued to write verse for many decades, reaching, in the case of Balestrini, up to uh, 2019. 
while it is obvious that these poets now had the neo avant behind them and that hypothesis, hypothesis of a return to the expressive, conceptual and ideological modules of the avant-garde seemed even to them unrealistic, unpractical, it is also true that they continue to write along lines of poetic far from the mainstream. Between the 70s and the 21st century, there was a lack of the group as formed in 1963, this true. But the dialogue between ex neo avantgardists did not cease, and above all, their poetic voice did not remain silent. To ignore the neo avant and what in poetry the Novissimi produced after the 60s, beyond personal literary tastes, makes it difficult to understand of their potential legacy that certainly touches poets like Giulia Nicolai, Corrado Costa, Adriano Spatola, albeit with due differences, and such as Patrizia Vicinelli and Vittorio Reta, who mixed suggestions drawn from Sanguinetti and Giuliani at the same time or such as, as Luigi Ballerini, who responded to the poetry of the Novissimi with his earliest book, Etc. E, work that reemploys in strange and ironic ways some of the solution of the neo avant at times mocking their poetic post posture, and that is to stay only with historical names. Erasing memory is always very dangerous, both in political and cultural terms. The legacy of the neo avant reaches younger generations as well, until our own day, albeit in dialectical terms and not mere epigonic continuation. Moreover, removing the neo avant from contemporary pro poetry or ignoring its effects, marginalized or places in the checkmate of the leveling postmodern or oblivion, even a brief and debated experience that was in fertile friction with Gruppo 63, the one accomplished between 1989 and 1993 by Gruppo 93, of which we have here some authors such as Mariano Baino and Tommaso Ottonieri, who participated in the group's work discussing theoretical and aesthetic issues. We cannot speak of a direct inheritance from 63 to 93. Yesterday, Tommaso Ottonieri has correctly puntualized that the Group 93 was born as a point of connection between generations. The young authors linked to the Gruppo 93, as Lello Voce argued, are not the grandchildren of the path of the Novissimi, and for many of them, including Marcello Frigione, the paths taken by the historical avant-garde and the neo-avant-garde were now impracticable because the technique used historically, the shock, the disorienting intent, had become ordinary almost every day. Of course, other critical perspectives exist and are still alive and practiced today, but they are not the majority, at least in Italy. If they did not exist, we would not be gathered here for the reappearance of the first, thanks to Luigi Ballerini and all the staff. All of us know the monumental project devoted to Italian poetry from its origins to the present, which appeared and is appearing uh, to the present day for the Lorenzo da Ponte Library. I now recall the two tomes dedicated to the poetry of the second half of the 20th century, from 1956 to the present day. The evocative title is Those Who From Afar Look Like Flies. This major work proposes an authentic rethinking of the canon that would also be needed in Italy. In addition to these volumes, edited by Luigi Ballerini and Giuseppe Cavatorta with the collaboration of Gianluca Rizzo and Dominic Siracusa, I would also like to remind the decisive translation of Novissimi, Poetry for the Sixties, edited by Luigi Ballerini and Federica Santini for American readers. 
And some important essays by Gianluca Rizzo, Gabriele Belletti, Alessandro Giammei, Francesco Muzzoli, Tommaso Ottonieri, by his anagraphic name, Pomilio sometimes, and Andrea Cortellessa, whom we heard yesterday with pleasure, and Stefano Colangelo, Luigi Weber, Gianluca Picconi, scholars very attentive to writings that do not slavishly fit into the canon. Identifying and analyzing legacy of the neo avant on more recent author is a most difficult task and a work in progress. The three principles outlined by Giuliani in the 2003 introduction to the Novissimi are still tools for verification. First of all, we should consider the reduction of the ego applied in poems that, in a different cultural landscape, do not propose the narcissistic exhibition of the ego and its lyricalized and sublimated biography. We can continue with the schizomorphic view of the real and with the proposal for a new metrical texture freed from syllabic measure and founded on the intonation of semantic groups or nuclei, another measure, not free verse. Just as an example, I will take one aspect in particular, the, relation, the relationship of the text with its texture. That means its metrical texture, which is a really basic relationship, I believe, on which the specificity of the poetic text is played out. Both when on the formal structure, the poet makes a visible exposed investment and when he intends to lower it with the aim of resetting it to zero. I choose as a parameter of investigation this component of the poetic test for two main reasons. Because it is the most controversial and risky note I run the ranger of irritating many, here present and absent, and because it can be an excellent litmus test of the relationship that each author has at the same time with the past and the present. In the meantime, I propose a few preliminary quotations in the manner of a catalogue of epigraphs that serves as a concise prologue by points. First, there is no escape from middle, there is only mastery, wrote T.S. Eliot. Second, Elio Pagliarani, harking back to Pound, indicated among the purposes of poetry, keeping in efficiency for everyone the language. Third, a literature that, in addition to being realistic, it has in addition to using language in all its semantic force, also aspires to an autonomy, to an objectivity as a specific use of language, requires the recovery and development of a rhetoric. Marcello Frigione, Il linguaggio in ordine così com'è. I believe these three different quotations can be useful related to the possible legacy of the Novissi. While it is true that Sanguinetti, Pagliarani, Balestrini, Giuliani and Porta had a non-peaceful relationship with the lexicon and forms of the canon, I am persuaded that each of them was very clear about the specificity of the literal text. The second avant-garde after the experience of the first, could no longer be naive. Breaking with previous tradition did not entail abandoning rhetoric and or metrical structures to cure. It implied the rupture, subversion and renewal. It implied the search for new paths and possibilities. In particular, in different ways from each other, they experimented with accents on the blank verse model, occasionally reducing the number from five to four, for example, Antonio Porta and Alfredo Giuliani, or they obsessively interrupted the rhythm of the text by breaking it up into detached anti-narrative frames through the repeated use of comma, Porta again or they broke up the lines of verse by adopting a stepped arrangement with accordion-like verses, perhaps alternating with blocks of endecasyllables, Elio Pagliarani. 
In other cases, they constructed apocalyptic verbal soundscape founded on collar sequences, thus creating an informal trend not only in lexicon but also in metrical substance. In this way worked the Sanguinetti, who in Laborintus had engaged an authentic end-to-end -end with medieval philology and literature. Some of them constructed verses of evident atonalism, strictly founded on the principle of collage that, as mobile machines, invite the reader to enter the open order of context, thus Palestrini's text in Giuliani's opinion. The immediately following production, in the midst of the neo-avant-garde, would confirm, with appropriate differences among the five novissimi, the same innovative procedures in poetic texture, compartmentalizing disharmonious and destructive, and yet, at the same time, reconstructive, edifying new architectures and charged with meaning. Examples are the exaggerated use of paragraphemic signs initiated by Sanguinetti from the end of Laborintus and confirmed in Erotopegnia, in Purgatorio dell'Inferno, and in a large part of the following text. The dilatation of the steps used by Pagliarani with an increasing need for breath. Think of Lezione di Fisica and Fecaloro. Palestrini's textual machines founded on rigorous combinatorial and rhythmic system in Ma noi facciamone un'altra. In the following decades, some of the novissimi would employ metrical forms of the tradition, from the sonnet to the octave, to the ballad, to the madrigal, but without any reactionary or regressive intent. This is the most remarkable thing without nostalgia for a past to be recovered, rather with aspiration for a metrical future to be built. Their intention was not to innovate, uh, uh, their intention was not to recover it of the canon, because traditional forms were subjected to innovate treatments. Now subtle slippages or contravention of the norm, now a violent, ironic twist, sometimes of vibrant comedy and outspoken virtuosity. The Alfabeto Apocalyptico, for example, written by Sanguinetti for Enrico Bai. Now an estranged employment which those forms strained, twist, emptied, renewed. Two concepts must have been clear to them and they sounded like a declaration of poetics, like a true way of seeing the world, not only the literary world. No form of spontaneous, natural continuity with tradition was possible. Giuliani wrote it clearly in the uh, 2003 preface to the ratio of novissi. There is a crucial difference between those who feel the ruining of exhausted forms and are prodded by it, and those who do not realize it and think they can continue it with diversionary maneuvers. Thus, one thing is to have a peaceful neometricism, deluded of serene recoveries with small maquillage variations, quite another thing to have a critical with or without the prefix neo, metricism, to adopt a qualification that in the late 80s gave birth to a formula of albeit difficult and discussed fate, that of critical postmodernism. Here, by critical neometricism, I mean a radically strange use of traditional devices, a use that is not only countercultural but already in itself erosive, contestative, invested with meaning and revelatory. This rests, of course, on an awareness of the specificity of the poetic test and the function of recursivity and variation historically studied by Lotman, between others. All too obvious, but not sufficiently considered by exegetes, is the fact 
this atonal verse does not mean verse divided of metrical structure or zero metrical verse. The tonic accents exist anyway. The syllabic texture is not avoidable. And in fact, with great pre precision, Giuliani spoke for Balestrini's text, among the others, of evident atonalism of metrical structure, a structure that was thus not at all eliminated, but permanent. Its rhythmic phonic warp was renewed. It changed this is the point, in the perception of the user, unable to recognize immediately the structure. It is almost superfluous to mention that the theoretical, theoretical essays included by Giuliani in the end of the Novissimi was titled La Forma del Verso, form of verse, discussed some Eliot's and Pound's reflections on metrics considered it appropriate to adopt among the poetic tools also the verse of the American type constructed as an atonal open sequence in the measure of breath and not for the eye but according to the ear, how proposed by Charles Olson's projective verse. To the ruining of exhausted forms mentioned by Giuliani in 2003, the Finovissimi responded neither with nostalgic regression, after all they were about to found a new avant-garde, nor, however, with the erasure of the metrical framework, but by listening to the gold derived from that ruin, that is, by seeking new trends, new breaths for their true contemporary poetry. A similar idea was expressed by Sanguinetti, who said that the adoption of traditional metrical structures can take place either in a kind of false, impossible naivete or in the awareness of their being historical shell. I quote from Sanguinetti. When metrical procedures are used, there are two ways to adopt them. One is to believe they are still natural to language and tradition, as if nothing has happened in the world. The other is to use them in an estranged way. Just as in music, one can use tonal combination as long as one understands them as one of the many ways in which one expresses a vision that is now a tonal. So I can write a sonnet. But it must be clear that I'm making use of a quotation. I am full of endecasyllables, but these endecasyllables are dismissed as much as possible, mortified, embedded with others. How not to use this treasure of experience? However, it's necessary to use it not as nature, but as history. Between 1950 and 1975, poetry has avoided closed forms. Today, the resumption of closed form we point traditionally, conventionally, to 1978, when Zanzotto inserts Ipersonetto at the center of this Galateo in Bosco, and Sanguinetti writes a sotto sonetto, in fact, a pseudo sonetto, later included in Segna Libro. Two poets had different attitude toward the recovered metrical form, as is evident from the difference in language, always a revealing element, as Sanguinetti made clear once and for all in the linguaggio etiologia. But it does not matter here the distance between Sanguinetti and Zanzotto, as much as to recall that a very early recovery of the closed form has, had been made by Sanguinetti in 1961, some year, same year of Novissimi, in a poem dedicated to an exhibition of the painter Mario Persico at the Schwarz Gallery in Milan, a ballad à la manière de Villon, to be a fair in the same year Pasolini Curiously enough, also wrote a Villonian ballad. Since the mid 70s, Sanguinetti has used sequences of endecasyllables in various strophic formations, often governed by the law of the acrostic orthotogram, 
the poem for Enrico Bugli of 1975, the Acrostico Batico for Antonio Pometz of 1976, and so on. Palestrini, too, used some traditional forms without naivete, but as architecture to be consciously renewed, crushing its most canonical joints. Even Le Ballate della Signorina Richmond assume behind them an echo of traditional structures that are anything but respected. An innovative evidence we can find in some recent Sistinas, which are among Palestrini's highest test. Already in itself, the Sistina is an exceptional and armored structure, the most closed and the most dynamic in our tradition, because it is circular, claustrophobic, mobile and fixed at the same time. The earliest evidence on a pattern in the odor of Sistina is tape mark first, from 1968. The most recent texts are in Cosmogonia, uh, 2010, or in a plaquette untitled Contromano that appears for Diaforia series edited by Daniele Poletti with an essay of by Fausto Curi. Despite the establishment culture, the experience of the Novissimi with their subsequent practice of poetry has left a sputtered legacy in younger generation. I will limit myself to a few na names. Some of these may be surprising because they are openly far from the proposals of the neo-avant-garde. Others, on the other hand, will appear more clearly approachable, albeit in generational and cultural differences, to a legacy of the neo-avant-garde that is assumed as a term of dialectical confrontation and as an example of awareness of the allegorical bearing that forms and structures can have. I believe that this problematic legacy can be grasped in works that keep subjectivity under control, that catch dissonant aspects of reality, and make pragmatic and countercultural use of metrical structures. Among those who were prodded by the reining of forms and made use of empty structures, I would mention Lorenzo Durante whom Tommaso Ottonieri called, with echoes from Dante, the best blacksmith of a strange and burnt metricity that I ever, ever known. Lorenzo Durante is the author of Aldrid and Merciless Operations. He wrote memorable sestinas obtained through grammatical casts from models of tradition, such as Dante's song, al poco sole, al gran cerchio d'ombra. I would also mention Gabriele Frasca, who, through stylistic work, intends to imprint poetry with a memorability not unlike that Sanguinetti recommended in the recipe of Postcarten 49. Frasca, from, far, very far from the neo avant also worked on formal structures by loading them with meaning, exposing them, making them also a vehicle, according to his poetics, of recognizability, memorability, and not least, morality. And in turn, Frasca has influenced younger authors, such as Adriano Padua, who in his 2009 book, La Presenza del Vedere, The Presence of Sing, included an interesting sequence of increasing, abraded, lacking, broken, decayed sonnets. An allegory of patterns may function in this way. Mention should also be made of two others from Genova. Marcello Frigione, who published in 1991 the Utrie, a very beautiful book, Sanguinetti's World, and recently the overall Naturama that collects tests from 1981 to uh, 2019. And Marco Berisso, who proposed the conspicuously artificial, critical, very virtuous, and above all, the sublimated reuse of the medieval literature. Then I'm pleased to point out Tommaso Tonieri and Mariano Baino, 
who are here with us, and who had with Gruppo 63 a dialectical relationship, at times not peaceful, but always fruitful, capable of taking into account the father's lesson, reduction of the ego, schizomorphic vision, formal awareness of metric manipulation, without, however, being crushed by it. Ottonieri and Bino worked both reusing and liquidating structures in verse and prose, also experimenting with fractured narrative forms. Sometimes authors of later generation reacted to the possible legacy of the neo-avant-garde in opposite manners. Some who identified themselves with so-called scritture di ricerca, research writings, have reacted by trying to reduce rhetoric, metrics and assertiveness, and have looked to experiences beyond the Alps, such as Jean-Marie Glaise, Pros and Pros, or in Italy, to the work of Carlo Bordini, or here in the US, to the example of Charles Bernstein. This is the case with Marco Giovenale and Michele Zaffarano. Someone like Vincenzo Ostuni combines in his Faldoni the influence of Pagliarani and Sanguinetti, bringing together attention to everyday life, presence of biographical elements, Marxist perspective. In Ogni Cinque Bracciate by Vincenzo Frungillo, it is possible to sense the importance and formal conception of breath proper to Pagliarani. The text has its fulcrum in the breath every five strokes of the swimmers. The metrical construction chosen then, the octave, with alterna alternating rhymes, is, so, is also a way to realize a text that was, says the author, a symbiotic connection between the body of the protagonists and that of the author. My breath was the breath of the swimmers. Therefore, I do not agree at all with those who demonize a priori the use of metric structures, of course. And, of course, I condemn the erasure of the less comfortable culture and history, a sort of cancer culture, because it makes the present incomprehensible. Finally, I would like to point out Ivan Schiavone, a poet who makes reflection and work on form as cornerstone of his poetics, convinced that the literary text, as Frisione noted, needs a code of shared practice. I must remember at least his last book, Tavole Stanze, in which there is a really innovative reuse of some metrical roots. But even in this case, the work on form is not an expedient. It is not a restorative intent. It does not bring back to life past structure with naive intent. It shows that irreducible, irreducible fall, it contributes to liquidating them and yet proposing new and elaborated ones. This is how Balestrini proposed that with his self-styled zigzag sestinas and the beautiful, extraordinary Istruzioni Preliminari that closes the 2010 book Cosmogonia. Here too, the underlying principle is what Eliot stated, valid for any written expression, even where the pattern is renounced. There is no escape from either. There is only mastery. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for this uh, bright uh, and uh, passionate uh, talk. And uh, I think that at this point uh, the, uh, we have a round table, correct Luigi, uh, translation as composition. So I would uh, like people for the round table to 
uh, sit at the uh, edge of the table, exactly. Maybe we can also... And the chair of the round table is a former colleague from UPenn, Kenneth Goldsmith, who will introduce the other participants. Ah, ah Peterson. Okay. No, 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 very privileged to introduce the participants in the round table translation as composition today. Uh, unfortunately, the first name on the list and the schedule, Kenneth Goldsmith, uh, he will not be able to attend. He's ill. Uh, I did want to say um, just that he is, has been since 2020, the ongoing artist in residence at the Center for Programs in Contemporary Writing at Penn. And he's had a long involvement with uh, Penn Sounds, uh, Penn Sound, the online poetry archive at Penn that we heard about yesterday afternoon. So what I hope to do now is, uh, since it is a round table, just introduce all three of the speakers uh, at once and then let them go in the order designated on the program with their uh, initial statements, uh, trusting that after that we'll have some uh, mutual discussion and uh, responses to questions from the audience. Uh, if you, uh, so that would leave uh, Gianluca Rizzo as the first to introduce. Uh, Gianluca is a literary critic, translator, and poet. He teaches at Colby College. He's the Paganucci Associate Professor of Italian and uh, language and literature at Colby, and the general editor with Luigi Ballardini of the Lorenzo da Ponte Italian Library, a book series published by the University of Toronto Press. His research focuses on modern and contemporary macaronic writing, contemporary poetry, theater, and aesthetics. He has published extensively and edited and co-edited numerous volumes. Uh, I'll just mention one. Together with Luigi Ballardini and Paul Vangelisti, he edited Nuova Poesia Americana, Chicago e le Praterie, uh, with Aragno in 2019. His latest monograph is titled Poetry on Stage, the Theater of the Italian Neo-Avant-Garde Neo with University of Toronto Press in 2020. Uh, our next speaker, Charles Bernstein, uh, if by some rare chance uh, you weren't aware of uh, Professor Bernstein's poetry before yesterday, uh, well, now you are. Uh, he is a poet, essayist, essayist, and scholar, and the author of numerous books of poetry, uh, including Near Miss, Recalculating, All the Whiskey in Heaven, Selected Poems, and many others. Uh, he's also known for his translations, uh, collaborations with artists and libretti. With Al Filreis, he is the co-founder of Penn Sound, an extensive archive of recorded poetry. He was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2006. He's a winner of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship, and he's the winner of the 2019 Bowling and Prize for Poetry. Luigi Bonafini is Emeritus Professor at Brooklyn College. He's translated over 14 
books, edited and co-edited five trilingual anthologies of Italian dialect poetry, and is the editor of Journal of Italian Translation. He most recently co-edited the anthology of poets of the Italian, Italian diaspora, Fordham University Press, 2013. His other honors include the 2014 Translation Prize from the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Italian National Translation Prize by the Italian government in 2003 and the 2014 Rises de, de Palchi Book Prize uh, for translation. So uh, as stated, we'll ask Gianluca to start and then go to Charles. I'm actually going to come to the podium because I have yeah. a PowerPoint, so I'll, I'll try to that's great thank you yeah perfect thank you Should be coming on in a moment. There we are. Well, um, thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you, Tom, for the introductions. Uh, I'm honored to be part of this wonderful panel today with such distinguished colleagues. And I'm very grateful to Luigi Ballerini uh, for convening us and for the many long conversations surrounding the conference and the uh, hundreds of other projects that we have going on together. Uh, thank you to Direttore Fabio Finotti for hosting us today, and naturally to Professor Stefano Albertini for uh, all the work in organizing and bringing us together. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So um, to this talk today, Luigi and I came up with the title for this panel uh, a while back on a train ride to Great Neck, New York, to see Berardo Paradiso, in fact. Uh, it was a short ride, but a very productive one. Uh, since then, I found out that um, Jerome Rothenberg actually has published an article by the same title, that is, Translation as Composition, and uh, that was in 2004. Upon reading it, I um, was pleased to see that uh, the ideas, uh, his ideas, are entirely compatible with what I'm about to say, so that's, uh, that's very good. Now, the written version of this presentation is quite long. I won't have time to read uh, through the whole thing in the 20 minutes allotted today. So apologies if sometimes I go a little too fast, but the written version will fill in the gaps and sort of make everything clear and connected. Now, part of uh, that article, the longer version, stems from an inquiesta, that is a survey, that will be published in installments uh, by the Italian online magazine uh, Le Parole e le Cose, and it has to do with the use of we, the first person plural pronoun, in poetry. Um, I found in my own writing that I always have a hard time saying or writing the word we. At best, it seems to me like something purely aspirational. At worst, it feels like the marker of a bad conscience, of a repressed reality. Most times, I cannot shake the feeling that writing and saying we is claiming a plurality that hasn't been earned. Um, now, this inquesta tries to dig a little deeper and expose, to use Lacan's terms, the real, with a capital R, underneath the veneer of reality, lowercase r, that is uh, that obscene, unbearable thing that underpins the world we all inhabit. My argument is that the difficulty in saying we is a symptom of something a little more consequential and more recent than the garden variety anomy endemic to modernity. It is the marker of an anthropological change. Mind you, I'm not the only one saying this, in fact, to help me along, I turned to a brilliant essay by Mark Fisher, with whom um, uh, Cecilia just mentioned earlier in her presentation, his capitalist realism that details the impact of capitalism 
at both the biological and uh, uh, psycho psychological level. The difficult to say we is a symptom of this anthropological change. I will mention in passing that other symptoms of this same issue can be observed in the debate over climate change, uh, we uh, that include also future generations and non-humans, such as animals and plants, as well as the analysis of technology's influence on society and the arts. Think of the role that social media is in, uh, has in shaping algorithmically, if you will, our we, or the possibilities offered by AI technology in augmented that we to include a non-human electronic entity, which in turn can become a means of interaction between authors and audiences. And I'm aware that this distinction is by now absolutely inescapably obsolete. And these are all issues that I explore more systematically in the written version of the article. Now, going back to my uh, main topic, why is it so hard to say we? And what can or poetry uh, or should poetry do about it? We are witnesses to a paradoxical process that on the one hand homogenizes perspectives, dreams, and aspirations. On the other, isolates and atomizes the population, confining them to their own very private interests. In order to overcome this paradox, we must expand the horizons of the imaginable and at the same time include within uh, the confines of our awareness the desires of others and it is, uh, um, the desires of others coming to terms with their presence, their validity, their urgency, their substantial equality to our own desires. That's really the hard part to do. Now, to reclaim a real political agency means, first of all, accepting our insertion at the level of desire in the remorseless meat grinder of capital. That's uh, Mark Fisher from Capitalist Realism. I argue that poetry can help in the process of modulation and reconciliation of desires at the level of the community. Such an invasive and consistent influence at the level of desire has had an intergenerational impact. Its consequences accumulate and multiply like genetic mutations passing from father to son. They have finally crossed the threshold that marks an anthropological difference. Contemporary human beings are substantially different from the human beings that lived half a century ago. This failure to be uh, there for oneself in spite or perhaps because of a complete homologation with the others is the real capital R, obscene in the sense of unthinkable, impossible to describe, that underpins our inability to say we in poetry. The trait that unites us all beyond our narcissistic traps seems to be the instability caused by the interference at the level of the desire, this anthropological transformation, the uncertainty and unpredictability of the inner landscape inside each of us, especially when contrasted with the immobility and universality of the system of values in which we are immersed. This is our starting point. This is the situation. Where do we go from here? I suggest we make two moves, different but complementary. On the one hand, we should revisit the tools offered by anthropology, and in particular, the tradition of kinship studies that goes from Levi-Strauss to Viveros de Castro as an ideal place, a disciplinary environment where we can build the philosophical tools needed to overcome the impasse. I say Viveros de Castro because of his effort in cannibal metaphysics, a book of 2009, to free anthropology and himself from a Eurocentric point of view, so as to turn it into a tool for the permanent decolonization of thought, with the secondary goal of devising another means besides philosophy for the creation of concepts. It seems to me 
that um, with marginal modifications, both program and tools can be adopted by poetic writing and literary criticism to attempt a permanent decolonization of language. In order to create a we in poetry, as I hinted above, we ought to focus on the transformation process rather than the product. Critic uh, Pinedo Diaz reflects on the use in literature of um, ideas explored in anthropology by Viveros de Castro. And here he says, what I'm referring to as creativity and creativity in Amerindian poetics specifically points to poiesis or making precisely as a mode of transformation through an engagement between humans and non-humans. This way of thinking creativity uh, as a praxis rooted in the collaboration between human and non-human is a crucial element, one that should be kept in mind when discussing the climate crisis and the social and aesthetic changes due to technology. The other move I would like to suggest is internal to poetry and has to do, as we said, with remodulating the structure of desire so that it may include the other, be it human or non-human, that is animal, vegetable, electronic. With Pagliarani, I say that the role of poetry is to plan new meanings, planning and not creating, because the creation of new meanings when it comes to language should be left to the community, society in history. We must plan the new because negation is not enough. The first step should be reassessing the role of lyrical poetry, reducing poetry as a whole to lyric poetry has damaged it and has painted it in the margin, in a corner, uh, has reduced its margins of operation within society. Furthermore, such reduction is in and of itself a symptom of that same real, capital R, suppressed by the capital built on atomization, isolation, alienation, and the failure of those social structures intended to organize citizens in the pursuit of the public good. But where to turn to? How to solve this double bind? Where to find a way beyond critical poetry, beyond lyrical poetry, sorry, and toward a new modulation of desire, one that is predicated on a we, the first person plural rather than uh, on the atomized and narcissistic I. The one solution I see lies in the way of the cannibal, the kind of transcreation, to use the campus term, that combines translation and creation. Just to be clear, I'm speaking here of an entirely metaphorical cannibalism. So let me explain. In the early assessment of the poetics of anthropophagia in Brazilian literature, Randall Johnson um, observed that Oswald de Andrade, the Brazilian poet and critic, author of the Manifesto Antropophago, valorizes the cannibalization of the colonizer by the Indian. Initially then, cannibalism is a form of resistance. Metaphorically speaking, it represents a new attitude toward cultural relationship with hegemonic powers. Imitation and influence in the traditional sense of the word are no longer possible. The anthropophagos do not want to copy European culture, but rather to devour it, taking advantage of its positive aspects, rejecting the negative, and creating an original national culture that would be a source of artistic expression rather than a receptacle for forms of cultural expression elaborated elsewhere. This is what I mean by translation as composition. Translation is always a communal enterprise. It presupposes a multiplicity of entities, a concurrence of authorities, a reconciliation of aesthetic sensibilities. Translation, even the straight up translation which Jacobson called interlingual translation or translation proper, is a locus where a complex we is established the starting point of an aesthetic and political we. It is the place where something weird and magical happens, something that calls into question 
key ideas at the core of our society, read capitalism. Property, ownership, authority, originality, authenticity, all concepts that on that surface seem to be meant to elevate us, but are actually the bonds that keep us subservient and quiet. I might be exaggerating here a bit, but I don't think too much. From an establishment's point of view, translation proper is a necessary evil. Eerie and disquieting as it is, it's a temporary fix while we all wait for the coming of the universal language. English, Russian, Chinese, math, take your pick, right? Now imagine a kind of translation that challenges and even disregards ideas of authorship, authenticity, propriety, and property. That would be outright dangerous, wouldn't it? This is what Haroldo de Campos called transcreation, but also elsewhere, transluciferation, a satanic enterprise. I will quote from a couple of sources to clarify what I mean, but think, isn't the cannibal already constituted as a we? Isn't the translator already a we? Aren't translation, appropriation, manipulation, interpolation of texts, a place where a we can be created, where an author, a translator, and a reader can convene to build together through and with language, a literary and political program. This is, I think, the way forward. Whether we'll reach our destination remains uncertain. In her article, From Isomorphism to Cannibalism, Odile Cisneros writes, in transcreation, the translator becomes, in effect, a co-author. He or she, he, his or her role, I'm sorry, being creatively at least equalized to that of the author. More emphasis is laid on the agency of the translator, on the role of the translator as an independent agent rather than a subservient passive force. Nowhere is this more evident than in the postscript the Campos wrote to his translation of Goethe's Second Faust, an essay entitled Mephistophostian Transluciferation, can't believe that came out right, where instead of transcreation, he calls his translation a transluciferation. Campos' ideas of anthropophagy, translation, modernism, and cannibalism are directly linked to Pound's thoughts on translation, criticism, and what to do with tradition. On this, see Medici, Obrega, and Milton, who write, translation, combined the concept of anthropophagy and the pounding idea of make it new, reading and translating the authors of the past, remote or not, modernizing them in such a way that they live and breathe again in a new cultural context. Both anthropophagy and make it new take on a synchronic critical view of the literary tradition. We can quote from the campus himself, the article entitled Anthropophagus Reason, Dialogue and Difference in Brazilian Culture. Oswald's, uh, the, Oswald's de Andrade Anthropophagy is a theory proposing the critical devouring of universal cultural heritage, formulated not from the submissive and reconciled perspective of the noble savage, idealized following the model of European virtues, but from the disabused point of view of the bad savage, devourer of whites, the cannibal. The cannibal was a polemicist from the Greek polemos, meaning struggle, combat, but also an anthologist, and we have quite a few anthologists in the audience today. Uh, he devoured only the enemies he considered courageous, taking their marrow and protein to fortify and renew his own natural energies. But who are these cannibals the Campus speaks of? They are the Alexandrian barbarians, he calls them, intellectuals such as Octavio Paz and Jorge Luis Borges, extremely refined, nimble, sophisticated practitioners of the fine art of chewing Europeans. The combinatory and ludic polyculturalism the parodic transmutation of meanings and values, the open, multilingual hybridization, 
are the devices responsible for the constant feeding and refeeding of these barocizing almagest. The carnivalized transencyclopedia of the new barbarians, where everything can coexist with everything. They are the machinery that crushes the material of tradition with the teeth of a tropical sugar mill, transforming stalks and husks into bagasse and juicy syrup. This type of carnivalism, cannibalism, assimilation of tradition that is other and is made one's own through a systematic inversion of values, a radical alteration of the linguistic code, and the macrostructures of genre, character, etc. These are all techniques that are not unique to the colonies and colonized literatures and peoples. This is instead what oppressed people uh, do, no matter where they are, no matter who is the oppressor, no matter the culture being uh, wielded as a weapon of subjugation. We find very similar rhetorical, aesthetic, philosophical, political strategies studying macaronic literature in the Italian Renaissance, for instance, like I do in my day job. I'm referring here to Teofilo Folengo and his Opus Macaronicum, of course. Now, anthropophagy is a violent form of inclusion, or even better, a violently inclusive practice, one that is absolutely unpalatable and undigestible to the capital. It is rooted in the first and best part of the historical avant-garde movements. Think of Alfred Jarry um, and his Perubu, for instance, always on the verge of swallowing wealth, objects, other characters, and other texts. Think of F.T. Marinetti in his Foundation and Manifesto of Futurism. Verranno contro di noi nostri successori, protendendo dita dunque di predatori e fiutando caninamente alle porte delle accademie il buon odore delle nostre menti in putrefazione. Right. Now, before closing, I would like to make a suggestion and war warn about a potential risk. The suggestion. The Campos and the Andrade didn't take into account the role of the reader in this process of cultural cannibalism, of linguistic transcreation. Here there is room for improving and updating their theories, I think. The reader must be made part of this creative process, because there is no longer a distinction between producer and consumer of culture, as we observed earlier, because aesthetic literary thought can aid political thought only when they are both professed as a praxis, as a craft that exists in the linguistic labor applied to the text because this is the age of social media and we can pretend it's not, because AI technology gives us the tools to make his dream, this dream, a pragmatic reality that anyone can experience. And now the potential risk. This cannibalistic practice could potentially lead to the creation of a refined, sophisticated, precious pastiche that pushes away readers because of its exquisite complexities and subtlety. The cannibal translation I'm advocating for must be digestible to the audience. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, postmodernism attempted a similar path and was readily assimilated and neutralized by the capital. The remorseless meat grinder, as Fisher has it, gobbled up all the antagonism and criticism implicit in those pastiche and ne neutralized them, rendering them just another flavor to choose from and to be added to our global ice cream bar of the pacified arts. The type of cannibal translation I'm describing should be easily assimilated by the reader and indigestible to the capital. This point I think bears repeating. I think I'm out of time. Uh, this is a lot and I thank you for your attention and your patience. I'm also curious to hear your reaction to these ideas. And I will close with a quote from Benjamin uh, that the campus uses to open his essay on anthropophagous reason. Genuine polemics approach a book as lovingly as a cannibal spices a baby. <laughs> and by this I mean that we not only need a fully developed cannibal gastronomy, but also cannibal cooking classes. Thank you.
Well, perhaps I can continue this uh, discussion and, and react right away to, to your talk because it fits into what I want to do. I want to say once again how happy I am to be here. I last spoke in this room uh, for a launch of the first volume of the large uh, translation project. And it was great, great to be back here. Um, I want to go back a little bit to yesterday, Marjorie Perloff's wonderful talk. And by the way, I believe that today or tomorrow she's giving a talk in LA on um, Augusto de Campos. Um, it, she mentioned, uh, I suppose within the realm of, uh, that you're not so much likely to know, but of younger poets, post-conceptual, appropriating news events and incorporating them uh, into work and wonders you know, whether that's possible. And, and, but I wanted to link this to Paul Beauvais's uh, talk, which of course I so much appreciated uh, Paul doing that. But he specifically uh, talks about Reznikov uh, testimony in Holocaust. So I just want to, for me, the, the, what I talk about, what he quotes uh, for me on, on Reznikov and the, the, the difference between testimony. Testimony is taken from court documents of the late 19th century of violent crimes and, uh, and he, he reworks them, but the language com comes from, from there. Uh, the Holocaust documents from the Nuremberg trial, so not in English. Uh, and there's a, there's a very great difference and I think uh, in a way, um, what Marjorie is talking about can be talked about in terms of Reznikov and the difference between those two things. And Paul makes that very clear in, in terms of the, 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 you know, in the aesthetics of, of historical representation and, and what's going on. And, and, and of course, I would say Reznikov, um, the work is a translation. It's a translation of those legal documents. Um, but to talk specifically now about your uh, talk, which I, you know, is very, you know, resonant with what I think think about translation. Uh, of course, you didn't mention Stein, but it's it's implicit composition as explanation. It's a crucial work for many of us and foundational. So here you're bringing in really pounded Stein, which is uh, I I welcome. Uh, is uh, obviously pound is the within American poetry the uh, an American modernist poetry has such an incredible. Um, influence in terms of thinking about translation and transduction, especially Geraldo de Campos, who's really in transcreation coming out of Pound. Um, and, uh, and those translations are amazing uh, that Pound does. But it, 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 the, the Stein is quite interesting in her own intervention in, uh, before, the power, before the Flowers of Friendship Faded, Friendship Faded, where she, takes, she completely rewrites uh, the, the, the poem that she's uh, putatively translating. I also want to mention uh, Dennis Tedlock along with Jerome Rothenberg, uh, both people that I'm very close to, Rothenberg's total translation, because he had the same title. So one of the things that Dennis emphasized, and he was my colleague at Buffalo in the Poetics Program, he translated the Popol Vuh and is perhaps a, a kind of a, a remarkable, one of the most knowledgeable American, certainly, of uh, Mesoamerican languages and, and culture. He always made fun of of the idea that when um, uh, uh, Europeans and Americans translate things, they like to make them look the same. He said, well, you know, you have it look like this, the line breaks visually the same, and then the translation has to look the same. He, he uh, ridiculed that idea and said that in uh, other cultures, and this fits to exactly to the quote that you had, it's, it's a continuation and a retelling. It has nothing to do with reproducing the actual look that sort of lost the spirit, one could say, of the translation. Um, now, cannibalism, um, again, a kind of interesting coincidence with Paul uh, being here. In 1999, I published uh, an anthology uh, of, um, uh, called 99 Poets 1999 <clears throat> with Boundary 2, the, the journal that Paul has edited for so many years and want to acknowledge that here too, that stepping down now this year, that the, his editing of, of Boundary 2 has been a crucial source of uh, of, of poetics from stuff, you know, from the early issues that uh, uh, to, to, to the present. But um, in, in that, I, I actually include an essay by Geraldo de Campos on cannibalism. So, uh, and uh, it's, it, 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 it's a great essay, and it took me a long time to kind of really understand from a Brazil, Brazilian point of view. But I'll, I'll say something, to, all that you're saying and continuing, there's one, one other issue which I think has to do with America and, 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 and Italy and uh, Europe and uh, the Americas and the uh, power dynamics, uh, which I think uh, 
you can follow just by my saying those things. I mean, Brazil is a huge country, a big country, but it's not the U.S., uh, and then the old world. So w one of the things that, um, and there's another very important manifesto in that Brazilian modern tradition called the Brazil Wood Manifesto. So Brazil Wood is an export item. One of the issues in uh, the formulating this Brazilian idea of cannibalism is not to allow your work to become local color for export. Um, so you, do, you, you want to preserve what is yours, even if it makes it op opaque. So cannibalism is a way to, uh, uh, to avoid export product. It also has to do with the influence of what's outside, but it also is to protect so that it doesn't become simply uh, uh, an extension of, uh, of European culture. Uh, and uh, I, I find that, you know, this, it, that power dynamic always becomes, um, you know, crucial in translation. Translation is, is, is never neutral. Uh, Geraldo also, speaking of this book, um, he there's the poem in here which I would, if I, there was time, it takes 20 minutes just to read that poem, called Test of Poetry, which a Chinese translator asked me a lot of questions. You know, what do I mean by what do I mean? What do I mean by what? What do I mean by mean? And so there's a whole thing, and you, it's, it's mostly cultural questions that he asks with cultural idioms that not only do I use, but but I, um, I uh, change. So it's very hard for Chinese. He said, I'm looking in the dictionary, and I, can't, I don't know what this is. First of all, he doesn't, unfortunately, have the basis and the foundation in American television of the 1950s. So this is a whole gap. That was a joke. But, you know, <laughs> but he, he, he has no access. Of course, in China especially, there's no access to American popular culture. Um, uh, so this poem about translation is, tr is translated in here by Carla Brunella, uh, and it's also translated by five other people. One of those people is Geraldo de Campos, and I, I sat with him in Sao Paulo and while he worked on this and learned an awful lot about my language and the language I used in that poem. Flack, I remember, he was really interested in what flack meant, and he, and most people who know Portuguese say, and I take this as absolutely true, that his version of it is better than mine. His, his transcreation of my poem about translation, it has more nuance, they tell me. And uh, he, he, was, he was great. Augusto and Geraldo, brothers Augusto, still around, 91 years old. Um, so um, I'm coming now to um, uh, talking about this. this um, book, but before that, I, I want to say, because I want to address the logic of translation. Um, in translation, thinking of A, the source and the, and the destination text is A and B, if A, then not B, B what? It's just a comment also on our, one of our talks yesterday. A, a can never be B, never wants to be B, will refuse to be B, but it bees in its own bee sting way. Um, so I'm so happy to have this book here today and also to have uh, published by Ilveri and to have Barbara Ancheski right here, the publisher, who's published so many, uh, you know, wonderful books. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But so when, when we did this book, um, we put together translations by a number of people, but Carla, who I had only met recently and corresponded with Liz in Venice. I'm going to meet her for the first time next week. You know, organized it, and Barbara agreed to publish it. Um, I said I didn't want facing pages. I'm not sure I completely agree with that, but it's uh, my friend uh, Claude Ray Jeanneau, the French poet, is adamantly against facing pages because he doesn't like the idea that you'd be constantly comparing. You want to just read what you're reading. And not, but on the other hand, of course, we all, you know, if you know both languages and so on, you might want to see what the what the uh, what that dialogue is. Um, so I said to Barbara, let's just do the Italian, because it wasn't interest, important to me to have the English published in in Italy. But she said, absolutely not. <laughs> you have to have the English. So we came up with this idea, which is like they do with westerns and romances, where you read it one way, it's uh, Italian, and the other way. And then the, the title, Echo, Echo. And then the, what I'm going to read now is, is kind of a, 
uh, a poetics of translation between or dialogue between Italian and American poetry. So you'll see why I'm reading it. And it sort of fits in uh, to the to the theme. And I think also Cecilia Bella's talk, when she lists some of the concepts, you'll hear how I'm I'm really talking about the same discussion that she's talking about, but I kind of warp it and, 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 and transform it. But I do think it's, a, it's an extension of, of your talk from the beginning, um, or a response. Now, I was going to, you know, in my typical vaudeville way, start to read it in Italian and then say, oh, I, I'm reading it in the wrong language. And, but um, I just thought, The ugly American's ignorance of the pronunciation of Italian would be better to mention as a joke I could do than actually do. Um, but the title, so this this is of course quite quite relevant to uh, to Luigi. So this is the forward. Perloff wrote the forward to the first volume, and this is for the second volume, uh, Tome Two. Uh, Those who from afar look like flies an anthology of Italian poetry from Officina to the present, 1925 to 2015. So those, those dates are relevant. That's why, in a, in a sense, it uh, fits into that, that part of what you were talking about, this uh, 1975 to 2015. So these are massive anthologies of material that some of you will know in the Italian, but nobody knows in English, knows some of it, but it's 95% unknown. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, 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 I wrote this forward, and I was, you know, thinking how I could say something in this context. And so I thought it was good in this context because it's also about translation. And uh, it's called um, Playing Cricket Without a Paddle. So I could uh, translate uh, that as well. Playing Cricket Without a Paddle uh, is a reference to the Frost, famous uh, comment about a Poetry is uh, free. Free verse is like playing um, tennis without a without a net. Um, I have a number of humorous responses to that over the years, but this was playing cricket without a paddle. But playing cricket without a paddle is also meant to be the Italian American exchange. One novelty. The complexity and scope of this volume will be a pure delight for readers coming upon some of these poets for the first time fully as much as it wins over readers familiar with the company here presented. Those who are from afar look like flies presents an immense and polydictory set of poems inside a vast and complex conversation among poets, critics, translators, poetics, trans creations, and poetry. I put it this way. Poetry is what is found in contradictions. In the previous volume, the editors emphasized research, which is the title of the panel coming up this afternoon, uh, as a key term for the poetry presented. For this next volume, I would like to modify that and say searching might be a key. In the wake of the powerful models for Italian poetry achieved in the previous decades, this period is marked by working in, about, and around, in and out of the shadow of a poetry of poetics not only of the immediate post-war period, but of Italian modernism. This anthology covers the period of my writing life since I published my first poetry collection in the mid-70s. It's striking how little known we have been to one another, we American and Italian poets of innovation and invention during this period. But insofar as we are in touch, a signal person to thank is Luigi Ballerini for both his anthologies of American poetry translated into Italian and his anthologies of Italian poetry translated into English. That Ballerini has swung both ways, if I might be permitted to put it that way, is extraordinary. It speaks to a kind of intimacy with both American and Italian poetry that benefits us all. Still, it's an uphill battle, mostly because the cultural insularity of U.S. American poetry which is so vast that it is hard for most of us to climb out of its abyss. That it's, that, which is hard because it's hard for most of us to climb out of its abyss. Framing our work as poets only in terms of U.S. history and culture might have worked through the mid-1970s, though probably not. After that, it has been crippling. 
Of course, there are many significant American poets and poetry scholars who have worked hard to bring voices outside the U.S. into our poetry. Perhaps the richest exchange between American poetry and non-English European poetry has been with French poetry. Firmly rooted in the 19th century, this relationship has flourished through the reciprocal engagements of poets creating translations that have significantly affected the poetry of each other's language. Alfredo Giuliani's 1961 anthology, much discussed here, Il Novissimi, is a touchstone for post-war Italian poetry. The influential English translation, edited by Ballerini and Vangelisti, as mentioned earlier today, was published by Douglas Messerly, Sun and Moon Press, in 1995. An expanded edition edited by Ballerini and Federica Santini, with illuminating new introduction and an additional section of poetics, was published by Agincourt Press in 2017. Il Novissimi was published just one year after the iconic anthology of U.S. novel young poetry, Don Allen's New American Poetry. The radical potential of both and some of the limitations might well be compared. I'm particularly grateful to other Italian translators with whom I've been in touch over the years. In addition to Ballerini Evangelisti, Lawrence Venuti, who's uh, thinking about translation is most significant to me and fundamental, who's writing about the poetics of translation. Carla Bilateri, Susan Stewart, Jonathan Glassy, Lawrence Smith, Thomas Harrison, Richard Malazzo, Jennifer Scapitone, Paolo Rodicchio, and Peter Valenti. These are just a few of the many translators who work in the field. I mention them because I want to acknowledge the supreme value of such personal points of contact. Two, three points of contact. In September 2017, Rainer Hansha of Contra Mundum Press wrote to ask me for a forward to a major Emilio Vila collection he was publishing in English translation. Hansha attached a photocopy of a letter I had written to Vila in, um, or Via, I guess, on February 13th, 1978. And this is what, he, um, uh, this is my letter to him from that time, from 1978. Dick Higgins suggested I write to you. I am a writer interested in many of the concerns I understand from Dick that you've made part of your work. In fact, I'm co-editing a newsletter, Language, which brings a number of texts, reviews, and short essays to writing, which concentrates in some primary way on language, featuring people like Jackson McClough, Bernadette Mayer, Ron Silliman, Tom Rayworth. I don't know how many of these people you would know. I will be in Italy in early April and would like very much to meet you if this was possible. Do you have a phone where I might reach you when I am in Rome? I look forward to hearing from you if you have time to get back to me. Unfortunately, I never got to meet you, not to write, or, or, nor to write the forward to the Contramundum book, but it was an early point of contact. Villa's work remains a powerful presence for me, and I regret we didn't find a way to include him in language as I had intended. But on that trip to Italy, I did meet Mili Graffi, and she was the Italian poet, apart from Luigi, with whom I have been in the closest contact over these many years. She was in language, and I was a contributing editor, and still am, for her magazine, Il Veri, and it was, at least in part, through Mili that I met Marco Giovanelli, right, right here in the front, uh, with whom I remain in touch. Though Ilveri, I became better acquainted with Nanny Balestrini's exemplary, quote, nonconformist ethical imperative, as Cecilia Bello puts it. Hmm. Menchaki, yes. Uh, Menchaki. <laughs> um, I last saw Millie in the fall of 2015. We met her apartment before going to dinner. Millie suggested we go to a bare-bones Chinese place near her apartment. I said I would prefer the most typical Italian restaurant. I live in Carroll Gardens, New York's Little Italy, where Italian-American restaurants and shops are the most local. Millie seemed a bit disappointed, but headed for a nearby spot. As we got near, Millie remembered it was closed. Since the Chinese place was on the same block, we ended up in a booth there, Millie, Barbara, and me, sitting on the hard wooden benches, spending the night drinking cheap wine, though high-end from a Carroll Gardens point of view, as you guys here will notice, and taking in broken English mixed with lingua franca of a shared life in poetry. I knew right away that this was as local for Millie as it was for me. 
We said goodbye for the last time as I headed back to my hotel hard by the Duomo. Mealy died at the end of this past spring. My third close encounter with contemporary Italian poetry had two parts. The first was in 1979, just a year after I had written to Villa. In 1979, Ballerini invited me to be a respondent to the Favorite Mouse, a conference organized at New York University, which brought uh, to New York several key poets included in this collection. Bruce Andrews and I liked Gianni Vatimo's talk so much that we published it in our final uh, volume of language. The second part was more than a decade later, in October of 1991, when I met Emilia Rosselli. Well, if truth be told, I didn't speak to her. She seemed splendidly unapproachable, but I did hear her read. Ballerini invited Rosselli and a number of Italian poets to Casa Italia, where we're doing that, to NYU, uh, for a conference called The Disappearing Pheasant. He also assembled a stellar group of American poets and critics for state and event, and I remain uh, grateful to him for including me. Listening to Rosselli, I recognized how shot with life, with light, a poetry so rife with strife could be. In a moment like that, I still recall the newly minted auditorium, the lighting, the feeling, the distance between poet and listener, American and Italian, disappears in a flash, reforming within that aesthetic encounter into a new, ever sharper delineation of distance and connection, one through each other. Three, the mix. In 1999, I edited 99 Poets, 1999 as a special issue of Boundary 2, edited uh, by Paul Beauvais. For that collection, Carla Bilateri introduced a short uh, selection from Renato Berilli, Mara Cina, Gianni Delia, Flavio Ermini, and Graffi. Bilateri's tripartite section scheme of different frequencies in that section is a good one to begin an approach to this volume. Idiolect dialect is one, experimental is two, and ontological is three. What's striking in reading the poems and poetics gathered here is the way these frequencies merge, clash, morph. Linguistic materiality rubs up against semiotic indeterminacy. Effective flashes are laid bare by their conceptual groundings. Lyric diction is hijacked by hijinks. Here are a few of the frequencies I hear in this grand collation. Commingling lucid confusions, contusions, heterogeneity of enunciation, emancipation, mystic erotica, mannerist imprecision, Janus charged pyrotechnics, syntactic detonation, desolation, denotation, hecubas, hiccups, counter hermeticism, counter counter hermeticism. Fractured silence, inclement noise, lost, missing, vanished, scattered, dispersed, unpredictable. Paramediated, microtraumas, lyric embossing, laboratories of inextricable mediation, meteors, diffraction of ideological orientations, weak verse, strong poems, almost nothing, reversal of frames, cruel explosion of rejoicing, roca socius compalat voce, what's me to Latin or Latin to me? Atlas of mimetic nonsense, Lucretian vernacular, ancient becomes the revenge of the new, news not news, newly boreal oreos, downpour of infatuation, sleep green ideas colorless as water, castles on clouds, tipsy, scattered in laminations and withheld sighs, smoked tongue, lighted window on rainy days, rinsed in blue fog, fake ruins, looted snares, puppets without strings, Blurring the soul, soil, cosmic crisis, an abyss that pulls, driving into frozen horizon, completely inside entropy, a body without armor, amour, ardor, honor, strange unrememberings, forgetting forgetfulness, tremulous murmurs, residual and indeclinable, discordant aligning, solitary war, epigrammic longing, aphoristic eleotics. Modern classical, classical modern, disfigured decadence, figuratively ritualistic, bewildered, bewilted, allegorical lipstick, elliptical symbolism, cups stained with saturation, Sardinian watches and Neapolitan teapots, and neo, 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 avant, 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 guard, 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 metropolitan envoy, group of two, four, six, eight, hike, puncture, pulse, elusive illusion. Mark, macaronic splendor, 
dialectic vernacularity, subalternity, the subaltern sublimed, rhyming images, ironic systems of falsification and lyric utterance, ca ca caducity, informalism, rubble of words, steepness of time passing, mind tossed frisbees, net of eye translated to parataxis of ear, polyphonic and the red devils, sonnets to the right of us, sonnets to the left of us, velvet aromas of ludic semantics, socialist chimeras and capitalist dystopias, infractions of indispensable arrhythmias, false spells, true shells, shadows of voices averting the standard, legible illegibility, bringing high down low, polyglotism, skewed mannerism, oh, obliquity, woven warps, whimsical deliriousness, flow of discontinuity, materialist spills, orphan contusions, hypotactic camouflage, emblems of make-believe, void in, void out, voracious layers of flocks upon flocks, grazing, disgraced, found by chance, after insomnia, as when Pasolini was around, the ancient smell, murmuring, half-lost fissures, patina of taint, amalgamated blind, upside down stars, apophantic drapes, sleds three millennia high, shuddering with tactile impertinence, Gromsky's tears, schizoorphic, in a web of infinite possibilities. In other words, poetry is like playing cricket without a paddle. Let the poetry continue. <laughs> um, today I'm going to talk about something, aspects of translation, which is uh, usually not uh, discussed, and that's translating dialect literature. And if I may give uh, just a a little bit of my background uh, as to why interested in dialect literature. Uh, I have translated quite a few uh, books of Italian poets. I translated uh, Pino Campana, Vittorio Sereni, Mario Luzzi, four books by Mario Luzzi, Attilio Bertolucci, and quite a few more. But at a certain point, I came across dialect literature. Just by accident. What I say by accident? When we, we were in college, PhD program, uh, nobody ever told us that Italian was really never a spoken language in Italy through the century. Say, what? Wasn't a spoken language? Uh, I'm not the one who says that. That's a linguist who says that. Tullio De Mauro. Uh, tells us in Historia Linguistica dell'Italia uh, dell Unita that in 1861, uh, the year of unification, only 3% of Italians spoke or understood uh, Italian. And that's even worse because those were mostly concentrated in the Tuscany region and in Rome. So, uh, I was in, uh, in my hometown in Isernia, I'm from Molise, and I came across, just by accident, by a book of poems uh, by uh, a local, not from Isernia, but from Molise, uh, Eugenio Ciresi. And when I read it, it was, it was a, an incredible discovery for me. It was the first time uh, in my life that I read something in my dialect that was good poetry. So I became very curious. So I looked around, uh, you know, I went to libraries, uh, uh, I talked to other people, I did some research. And then we two uh, of my friends, scholars, Sebastiano Martelli and Gian Battista Paralli, we uh, edited uh, an anthology of Molise poetry uh, with uh, trilingual dialect, uh, Italian and English, and we with uh, 
sempre. Uh, and with uh, critical introduction. And after that, I, I, I became even more and more interested. So I, I said, I have to see what, what else is real. So I started looking for uh, a dialect poetry in Southern Italy. And after a while, I edited uh, an anthology of poetry from Southern Italy. So it's a trilingual anthology with a dialect, Italian, uh, in English with uh, critical introduction, you know, critical apparatus. And uh, there were about 40, 40, each region was introduced by an expert in the region uh, and who also chose the poets. And all the uh, poetry was done by uh, good translators, people that I worked with that I knew. And uh, one of the people that helped me uh, with this anthology was Achille Serrao who I think is one of the best, passed away a few years ago, it's one of the best uh, dialect poets uh, of uh, recent, recent years. And, and then with Achille Serrao, I, we edited an anthology of dialect uh, poets from Central and Northern Italy with the same apparatus, uh, critical introduction, trilingual, you know, experts looking at. So altogether, we had, uh, in these two anthologies, they're very big, big anthologies, uh, we had more than uh, almost 100 poets, totally unknown in the United States, uh, very, uh, not very well known in Italy. And then after that, <laughs> we were not. Achille and I collaborated another anthology, which was uh, contemporary Italian poetry, so Via Terra, no? Via Terra, an anthology of new Italian poetry, uh, dialect poetry, or uh, poesia neo-dialettale, as it, you know, we call it. And again, we did another one also, which I thought was an important anthology, of Neapolitan poetry from the 16th century to the present. Uh, and again, these were incredible discoveries for me, the, the excellent, some excellent poets. So, you know, I've been working, and, and after that, of course, uh, I translated quite a few dialect poets, uh, Eugenio Cirese from my, uh, my region, uh, Jose Rimanelli, whom you probably know, uh, because he wrote in English as well, he won the, uh, the American... Uh, the American Award uh, for his uh, novel uh, Benedetta and Gastelum, and uh, several more, uh, Seppe Jovine, and so forth. So I, I, you know, I became very much interested in dialect poetry. I still am. And uh, if anybody's interested, I have uh, uh, a website that is dialectpoetry.com dialectpoetry.com and I have everything I have a hundred poets uh, again translated into Italian and English with the dialect text uh, uh, critical introduction and then we have essays uh, huge bibliography so anybody interested in uh, dialect poetry this would be the place to go and uh, on top of that I uh, edit this uh, Journal, Journal of Italian Translation. Uh, this is the very last uh, issue just came out. And if anybody is interested, you can download, by the way, at, uh, at the website, dialectpoet.com, you can download all of the anthologies that I mentioned. All of them. And uh, this one is, uh, you can download all of the issues at uh, jitonline.org. JITonline.org, all of the issues uh, are free to download. In this issue, in, in, in each issue, uh, I always include some dialect poets. In this issue, I have Achille Serrao, whom I translated. I have Mario Pinna, who's from uh, Sardinia. Salvatore Di Giacomo, of course, very well known. Cesare Zavattini. Franco Loi, and also a few dialect 
poems by Pier Paolo Pasolini, not translated by me, but somebody else. I uh, just mentioned that I've also translated all of the dialect uh, poems of Pier Paolo Pasolini, and they're going to be uh, issued, uh, it's going to be published soon by Luigi Gallerini and John, uh, John Garizzo. In a while, I'm working on it. It's a very complicated, it's a complicated, if I have some time, I'll talk about it, of the translation, because it's very, very challenging. So and then I, I wrote uh, uh, an essay uh, on uh, translating uh, literature, and uh, I began by citing not an Italian uh, poet, by citing Mark Twain. Why are you citing Mark Twain? <laughs> because in his introduction to Huckleberry Finn, this is what he said. In this book, a number of dialects are used to wit the Missouri Negro dialect, the extremist form of the backwards southwestern dialect, the ordinary Pike County dialect, and four modified varieties of this last. So he's talking about seven varieties of dialects that he uses. And he says, the shadings have not been done in haphazard fashion or by guesswork, but by painstakingly and with the trustworthy guidance and support of personal familiarity with the several forms of speech. So he knew these dialects very well. I make this distinction, he says, for the reason that without it, many readers will suppose that all of these characters were trying to talk alike and not succeed. So, uh, the, the translating, uh, the, the, uh, of course, this poses a huge problem for translators. Are you, you going to do that? You, know, you have seven different kinds of uh, varieties of dialect. Are you going to do that in another language? A huge problem. Uh, Jean Duval, who also mentions uh, this, Jean Duval, by the way, is one of the, one of the first people to translate dialect uh, poetry in the United States. I think in 1981, translated uh, uh, Trilussa, uh, Pascarella, and he, and he talks about this, and he says, well, any translator of uh, uh, Huckleberry Finn should, should pay attention to what uh, uh, Twain says in his introduction. But it's just an impossible test. So how are you going to do it? You're going to have somebody who speaks Milanese, you know, somebody who speaks. But I would suggest another possibility. It's a very difficult uh, uh, enterprise. So because these dialects or varieties of dialects are in a very small, restricted area, I would wonder if, you know, is it possible to find the same thing in Italy? You know, very small area where so many varieties of dialects are spoken. Is it possible? My answer is yes, yes, of course it's possible. How are you going to do Well, why? Because Italian dialect, well, you know, when you speak of a Sicilian or a Neapolitan, any dialect, Sicilian is, uh, when you say Sicilian, it's, it's, uh, it's an abstraction. There's no such thing as one Sicilian dialect. You have many different kinds of Sicilian dialects. So, you know, it depends on Catania, is very different from Palermo, Agrigento, and so forth. But that's true of every region in Italy. And I would mention my region, Molise, which is a very small, one of the smallest in Italy. I can tell you, because I'm familiar with the dialect, that, you know, you move, uh, in my case, for example, I'm from Isernia. There's a small town about a few miles away. And I remember when I was a uh, you know, kid growing up that I had difficulty understanding what they were saying. They were talking a uh, recent dialect, but it was quite different. So there are, you know, several uh, dialects. For example, let me give you another example. Uh, if I say the word, uh, the word filo, no? in my dialect it would be filo, like Neapolitan. By the way, my dialect, for some reason, is very similar to Neapolitan. I don't know why. I have to repeat it. Uh, 
very, very, very soon. If you go to uh, Agnone, not too far away, they say something like foil. Foil. So, my God, where did that come from? Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, Jose Di Manel is from Casa Galenda. So in my town, the word the river, no, fiume, is like Neapolitan, shume. In Casa Galenda, it's uh, hume, with an H, inspired H. So I think that what might be one possibility, you know, to, to have uh, several varieties from a very restricted region uh, to handle this kind of thing, which is, you know, an impossible thing to do. Uh, I looked up the... Uh, Italian translation of uh, Huckleberry Finn, just to get an idea of what's happening. And uh, I have a passage from uh, Jim. You know, Jim is one of the characters who speaks in a very uh, strict dialect, very difficult to understand. I'm not going to read it because I, I can't read it. You know? I talk up and she it. very difficult to read. But I'll read the Italian translation. It says, uh, Mi sbatto giù dalla collina e penso di sgraffignare una barca lungo la riva sopra la città, ma c'era ancora in giro della gente, allora mi nascondo nel vecchio negozio del bottaio, quello tutto a pezzi che sta sulla sponda del fiume, per aspettare che se ne vanno. So, totally flat, no... So all of the dialects are totally flat, and anybody who reads Italian has no idea of what the original was like. So, and Mark Twain himself uh, criticized the French translator of, uh, of his uh, famous uh, story, The Jumping Frog, uh, for, having using, for having used standard French without any understanding of the importance uh, and the implication of the use of vernacular. And uh, Twain said, Benson, the translator, has not translated the story at all. He has simply mixed it all up. It is no more like the jumping frog when he gets through with it than I am like a meridian of longitude. <laughs> So you know, this is a very common problem. Uh, we'll, uh, let me see if you, uh, I have a lot of, uh, but in, in the Italian, uh, Italian novels, one of the, the most famous uh, example that can be compared to Mark Twain is Gatta, no? But pasticciaccio, so in the, you know, Garda mixes all kinds of dialects, Milanese, uh, Siciliano, and in Gravallo, the commissario is from, from Morisano, he's always saying things like Uglia, Olio, Yomre, Yomre is the knot that he's trying to unravel. So he's got all, and then he also has all kinds of sectorial languages, uh, you know, technical languages, so it's extremely difficult to. So uh, the, uh, the person who translated uh, Gandla was uh, William Weaver, uh, you know, famous translator, but essentially he flattens everything up, doesn't, nothing. So, for example, he's criticized by several people. Uh, one of them, Brian Altano, uh, he takes a translator to task for not having used sufficiently colloquial vernacular language in the translation. And, and he cites, let me, let me just cite. It. So, this is uh, selling porchetta in the market. He says, la porca, la porca, c'avemo la porchetta. Signore, la bella porca della Riccio con un bosco di rosmarino e della panza, con le paradine di stagione. Lo dico io, assaggiatele. Durava un attimo a riprendere il fiato e poi a scoppio. 1,90 letto, la porca, è una miseria, signori. 
a chi vende e chi compra, uno il 90 letto più meglio fatto e detto, fame se avanti con i baiocchi alla mano, sole e spose, chi non magna non guadagna, poi sottovoce a una belloccia dice, a voi ve lo è meglio boccone. Lo giuro, mi piacete troppo, siete troppo buona. So, uh, you know, uh, we were simply flattened so, so everything up. I just mentioned uh, the last, uh, the very last line where Weaver said, I'll give you the best part. That's a promise. You're my type. All right. You do pretty. So he translated, you know, si è troppo buona, he translated it to pretty. Obviously, he doesn't understand what the, you know, the implication of <laughs> So, uh, all right, let me. Uh, So uh, Alfano also uh, cites Weaver because Weaver has an introduction. An introduction says, uh, speaking to the English speaking reader, it says, imagine, imagine the speech of Gandalf's characters, you imagine, uh, translated here into straightforward spoken English as taking place in dialect or in a mixture of dialect. He's telling the reader that you should imagine. <laughs> you know, so Alfano said, you know, how in the world is the reader, what, what is he gonna do? So, so you know, I call very fine, and Cuerpa Sicciaccio are uh, extreme uh, example of uh, multilingual uh, context. And uh, in, the, uh, in the translation, of uh, Trilussa, just, just switching to poetry. Uh, Miller Williams, who translated Trilussa, he says, there is, is, this is an important passage because essentially most uh, translators of dialect poetry follow this example. And he says, there is in some quarters an assumption that because Romanesco is looked upon as dialect by those who don't speak it, or you translate it badly, Belli's poems can be truly translated unless they are rendered into some sort of, some sort of patois, some special language spoken by a people outside the center of culture and mostly deprived of whatever the culture offers. People, there is, like the Romani or Trastevere. And then he said, the truth, of course, is exactly the contrary. If we render the poems into any kind of dialect, slang, or jive talk, we hear them only as the middle and upper class Roman would have heard them and hears them now. So the, the, the assumption is that, of course, if anybody speaking dialect, Dialect is the natural way of speaking. And I said that as a, as a dialectophone because uh, people of my generation, most people of my generation, you might, some of you certainly know, we spoke dialect. You know, Italian was uh, something that we learned in school, like a foreign language. But outside of school, we always only spoke dialect. So speaking dialect, for me was and still is, even though I don't get a chance to speak it uh, anymore, uh, the only natural way really to speak it. So he, he mentions uh, also the way he translated some of For example, he says one, uh, San Giuseppe trattando Sariscarda, you say Giuseppe Maria, no? Dopo leva a Somaro la bardella e appoggiano tre mesi la libarda. And so he said, the way he translated it, St. Joseph, meanwhile, rubbed away the cold beside the fire and settled up the ass and put his tools away for a long time. So he's saying he's, he's uh, preserving, you know, it's an ironic comment on the virgin's chastity, right? So, 
retaining the subversive force of the original. So it's more, and, and then, uh, then we are more up to it. Uh, then I'd like to mention maybe Croce. Uh, trans Croce translated the Pentamerone, which I'm a piece of a great book. If anybody wants to really understand the wealth of the Neapolitan language, the Pentamerone is what it should be. So, uh, Croce uh, said, so, by the way, the Pentamerone was first uh, uh, translated, strangely enough, into Bolognese dialect by Maddalena Teresa Manfredi, and then into Italian anonymously in 1754. It was later translated into German, into English, 1984, 1848, 1983, 1923. And in his uh, long introduction to Pentamerone, uh, Croce finds the German-English translation better than the Bolognese or Italian ones. And he says, I've been very faithful to the words of the text, trying not to diminish the quantity and to alter as little as possible the quality of the images they contain. But I've acted freely in rewarding the syntax, which in Basile is defective and often very bad, mainly perhaps because the work was published while still unfinished and in many parts still in the draft stage. I resisted the temptation to which someone else would have given in, <laughs> someone else would have given in, to substitute Neapolitan idioms with equivalent words and phrases of current Florentine usage. And I've tried to preserve not only the Baroque adornments, but also a certain Neapolitan flavor of the book. Uh, in 1932, Norman Mosley Penser translated also that, uh, Italian, but mostly based on uh, Croce's Italian translation. And he says, I've endeavored to keep two main objects constantly in view. First, to translate literally, taking noun for noun and verb for verb, and secondly, to preserve all the puns, local allusions, similes and metaphors of the original before speaking of the stuff. Well, he goes on and on, but he uh, essentially criticizes Croce for this same translation. Uh, he said, for example, <clears throat> he gives an example of, uh, of the original. Ah, Zacchara, Frasca, Marduse, Bischaliet, Salvariella de Zimmer, Pettola Cur, Chiappa de Mbis, and he said, the first four words present little difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> but what is the meaning of Sautariella de Zimmaro? He's really fixed on the Sautariella de Zimmaro. You know, Goethe gives it, uh, in my Italian, Saltarello di Cembalo, and Martellino di Cembalo, something moving very quickly, but he, he, uh, he comes out with the, he, he looks up dictionaries, you know, and his own was uh, a translation was not none of these, so Croce was wrong. The translation is Billy Goat, a Billy Goat that jumps up, and so on and so forth. Uh, in the uh, 16th century, uh, the most renowned dialect poet of his time, uh, was Sicilian, Giovanni Meli. Meli's uh, language is a very particular language, Meli Sicilian. It shows how the question of dialect is so intimately connected to Italian literature and that requires a specific treatment. So uh, Gaetano Gibola, Gaetano Gibola has translated all of Meli, uh, uh, the Sicilian poets, I don't know if you familiar with him that he publishes Arba Sicula, which is both uh, published in Sicilian and English. But
by the way, is a publishing house, Vegas, just received the National Translation Prize this year. So, you know, it's done very well. And they published it this one. So, and he says, just to see how he's aware of the, you know, the various shadings of that. So while Mary may have intended to create an illustrious Sicilian, the result of his efforts was a mixture of the literary idiom of Italy, that is Tuscan, especially in its Arcadian tradition, and of Sicilian. The interrelationship between these two components represent an essential feature of Mary's language. This interrelationship may be articulated along an axis that includes a highly literary Tuscan, so a direct quotation from Pretar, for example, passing through a line of expression that is structurally Tuscan, but with Sicilian superimposed on it. A third point of the axis might consist of illustrious Sicilian, that is a purified form, uh, a purified form uh, of the local Palermitan dress, and distilled from a variety of idioms spoken in civics. So, you know, he goes on and, and he gives uh, some examples that I'm not going to read in the, uh, of his translation. Of, uh, I just want to mention uh, Rimanelli and Serrao. As I said, I've translated Giuseppe Rimanelli from the Molisano. Uh, the, word, uh, the book is Moliseide. Uh, Moliseide. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just read uh, the uh, first uh, few uh, lines from, from the book, just to give you an idea so you can understand. One that seek I read to do pensiere for a gagno so, it's fanotic. O sangue di secchiata, si straniere, a via da terra di ed onde sta. I don't know if you were able to understand that you had some difficulty, and, but from my point of view, and even though this dialect is different from mine, quite a bit different, uh, this is an absolutely natural way of speaking. There's nothing unusual about it. So the translation is very plain. When you get near the glass panes of your thoughts, and outside the sun weeps and darkness falls, you blood turn into ice, you are a stranger. The road back to your land, where can I be? So, you know, very natural. And the same thing with Serrao. Uh, do I have any, uh, anyway. Uh, Serrao is you know, one of my favorite. Uh, he's in uh, Neapolitan, see if you understand this. In Gembe c'è stata che parola. Non cagnava nell'aria, a tu nui e frieone con l'uoglie da Iacovella, a re da bocca, a tenuta per paura, con manienza che sacci. There was a time when words didn't change the air, around these parts they fried in the oil of cunning held in the mouth by fear, expedience, maybe. And he goes on and on, because uh, Serrao, like uh, most neo-dialect poets, uses uh, a dialect that is not a Neapolitan dialect. It's a more peri from uh, Caivano, more peripheral dialect. And he also did a lot of research, uh, you know, philological research. So he goes on and on explaining what the Iacovella means, where it comes from. Comes from French, shark, and so on. So on. Let me skip to. So, the uh, most of the uh, translators, I have some quotations from them translated uh, for the anthology, say the same thing. You know, I translated uh, the dialect as, as if it were Italian. Not, not as slang, not, not as. Uh, Zanzotto, if I may mention Zanzotto. He, uh, uh, Gianuel, or 
John Wiley, I'm not sure I did it. Well, and Ruth Feldman translated uh, uh, a collection of poetry, Peasant's Way for Fellini Casanova. Now, <clears throat> San Sotto wrote to uh, John Wiley, and he said, in the translations, therefore, if the passage from Italian to English or into another language is already uncertain, the passage from dialect to a foreign language becomes almost impossible. The dialect cannot be rendered in standard English. It would be necessary to find some patois or slang and nevertheless was rather widely known in the Anglophone area. This is completely different from so John Well <clears throat> did follow this advice. And uh, I actually uh, reviewed his translation and he explains, you know, in the introduction that he decided not to follow some doctor's advice and to translate the dialect as if it were normal English without slang and without uh, what, and he says, whether one settles for uh, standard English as we have done, or attempts to move more appassively towards some version of the dramatic, the risk of distorting the sense of the dialect is great. Okay. Um, I, I have a, can I have five minutes. Uh, I want to just mention Ragazzi di Vita di Pasolini, which is, of course, uh, as you know, it's imbued with uh, Romanesco. So how did uh, how did the translators uh, end? Well, there were two translations. Uh, there is an article by uh, Piotr Kowalski. Uh, he mentions. Uh, so the first translation was done by Emil Capuglia, Capoglia. Uh, and he says, no, la sua traduzione, this translation is characterized by an animation of the dialect, total animation of the dialect. So totally dialect is totally neutralized. And as you know, the, all the, first of all, the, the title of the book is The Ragazzi. That's what he calls the book, The Ragazzi. What, 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 what does that mean? He didn't, he didn't know, he didn't understand what Pasolini meant. He said, ragazzi di vita. Pasolini himself, you know, he was trying because of this. Uh, so in the courtroom, he said, ragazzi di vita means ragazzi di mala vita. So we have it from, you know, most one. And the, uh, the other translator is N. Ghost. You know, you know, he has translated all of Ferrante's uh, novels. So I downloaded uh, you know, the translation just to get an idea of what she did. She did the same thing. Uh, so if she did totally, uh, although she calls the book Street, street Kids, which is much closer to the Ragazzi, Street Kids, the title. But, you know, for example, uh, one, of the, one of the kids is talking, Ricetto. Oh, a do I? A casa vado, fece Ricetto. Tengo fame. Vi a casa mia, no? A figlio della mignotta. Ti vedo dietro il compare. E c'è sta il pranzo, no? And uh, the translation is totally different. Oh, said Ricetto, I'm hungry. He came into my house, the pastor. His godfather shouted after him, there is the lunch. And uh, I, I don't know if I can talk about Camilleri. I think the God's done. <laughs> I think that uh, Luigi would like to add something. Uh, uh, because uh, thank you very much for this very really, uh, illuminating 
entertaining <laughs> and, and uh, amusing um, presentations and uh, some editorial ideas have actually emerged from uh, uh, but I'll keep them my, to myself for By a way, we have a direct poet uh, uh, personal <laughs> okay okay uh, but I, I just uh, a translator of Cavalcanti into Milanese <laughs> As a matter of fact, I wanted to mention uh, Cavalcanti and Pound because of a word, one single word that uh, gave Pound some problems when he encountered it. We're talking about a sonnet in which Cavalcanti depicts the most attractive ladies in Florence. And of course, the most attractive of the most attractive is his own. And he says, so much so, she advances all others to such an extent that they all are victim of wrath. Ira Pound pondered on this. How could the best ladies in Florence be called wrathful? Well, little do we know that Ira in the 1300 meant wrath, of course, but it also meant frustration. So much so that in the Calabrese dialect to this day, when children cut their teeth, they say, tiene ira. You know, that's a frustrating feeling that you have because they are not really coming out and the children are agitated. Of course, you'd be frustrated if you met Cavalcanti's own lady and even though you were one of the best, you could feel frustrated before the beauty, the intelligence, the sympathia that she represented. So, we come to Ezra Pound. And do you know the word he uses to translate wrath? Thirst. Thirst. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Of course, the implications of thirst and wrath are very different. But the idea of sete, you know, of the idea that he, that these ladies are desirous to quench their thirst and to become as intelligent and as beautiful, that's cannibalizing, I think, quite in, in action. You know, that's, that's really cannibalizing and digesting and remaking and so on. And Pound is frequently in that situation, despite the fact that one of the leading Dante scholar of... Uh, the 20th century, Gianfranco Contini said, what do you expect from someone who comes from Idaho? Well, we expect a very intelligent reading of Dante Alighieri. But I also would like to take this opportunity to thank you, everyone who keeps mentioning my name. Well, I have to say that I am only the tip of the iceberg. You know, there are a great deal of people who are working with me. And when it comes to the mosque, there's one in, I'd like to thank in particular, and that's Beppe Cavatorto, the most elegant man you've ever seen in your life. Right there. It would have been impossible to turn out 2,500 pages, volume one, as it would have been impossible to turn out 2,485, volume two. When you go back to the Casa Italiana, we have exhibited on a table some of the pages of the new volume to which most people in the audience have contributed as author, translators, Bonafini, Gianluca, Federica, Fabrizio, Cecilia, Giovanni, you, you know, I can go on for The entire house here is in the volume. Thank you so much and have some refreshment now, I think. All right, this is uh, going to be a poetry reading. And uh, in our usual fashion, we alternate American poets and Italian poets. The more we move into this uh, kermes, into this conference, the more it comes clear that there aren't too many differences except for language. Uh, but all the people involved are somewhat, uh, as I like to say, uh, 
belong to this ecumenic and biased world of uh, research or complex or radical poetry, uh, which uh, in and of itself uh, sounds be begins to sound like a nation, you know, like an Indian nation that is uh, coalescing in turn in in turn in around a very precise idea. Now. We will begin with Mary Jo Bang. Uh, Mary Jo couldn't join us, uh, but she's going to be connected via Zoom, I think, or some other infernal uh, uh, device. Uh, and uh, uh, okay, she's going to appear. She's right now very small, all the way up. Uh, now I just want to say that I am. Uh, well, I'm fond of the poem of the poems written by all the poets here. Mary Jo, uh, good to see you. And uh, um, in, in particular, I was attracted to Mary Jo's own poetry uh, via one of our own. That is to say, Dante Alighieri. Uh, Mary Jo uh, is translated Inferno and Purgatory, and for published by Grey Wolf. And uh, she's now working on Paradiso. What it really is attractive uh, about a work is that instead of making English sound like Florentine of the 1300, she's decided to make Florentine of the 1300 sound like English of the 20th and 21st century. And uh, it seems to me that this is a very uh, astute and very intelligent and very warm uh, act, act idea. Uh, of course, many Dante scholars would uh, probably object and be uh, horrified, but uh, p lovers of poetry instead may, in fact, respond in a totally contrary fashion. And, in, and, and because what we have at the end is a poem of Dante Alighieri and Mary Jo Bang. And uh, uh, Mary Jo Bang features in, uh, in one of the anthologies that Gianluca and I and others have been putting together, Nuova Poesia Americana, colon, Chicago, and the Prairie Towns. Uh, and uh, she's now coming to us from, from St. Louis, from, uh, where she teaches at the University, uh, George Washington University. Uh, some of the poems that she's going to read, as usual, will be, uh, she will read in English, of course, and the poems will run uh, on the screen in translation. Uh, some of the translations are my own. I ask for your indulgence. Thank you very much. Mary Jo. Thank you, Luigi. Can you hear me? Yes, Hello. yes. OK, thank you so much um, for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful festival and that's celebrating you as well as poetry. And thank you for having uh, translated these poems a long time ago now. And um, they were written even longer ago. They were published in 2001. And if you do the math, that's 21 years ago and um, much has changed. So I'm going to read um, from that book that these were translated from. It's called The Downstream Extremity of the Isle of Swans. And um, I understand you will see the poem in Italian. So um, this first poem is This Supposed Alchemy. And in this case, it's an alchemy of um, relationships, not metal um, or minerals. And um, I always tell my students there are three kinds of love poems. There's the, the love poem, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. There's the revenge poem and there's the elegy. And this poem I think is uh, part elegy and part revenge. This supposed alchemy. What you took was an arm, a hand, a face from an outshining mirror. We were carried away in the trunk of a hollowed year. Not whole, never were, with skulls still amiss, draped windows through which one can't see. And after the violent began the seeking, veil after unlifted veil, alkalite, acolytes trailing behind, foot drag and dream, while someone crooned some Gregorian, the flock in the dovecote asleep, nestle, my sweet, here beside me, love as lapsed, as indifferent, moon as an end, appeasement turned bitter by cultured contempt, 
nestled, my sweet, here beside me. The hand opens to show its new tooth. Can you believe? In these arms you were once a birthright eschewed, a duchess of Windsor, a darling. The cheek will always be proffered, but the seam, seam, it no longer meets. The year chases its tail. When it's April in the eye, it's December elsewhere. In the air, a scent satellite is traveling faster than anyone ever expected, causing a state of fret among flight controllers. What is acceptable speed for crossing the bridge, sliver of silver, between notions of gravity? Windows allowed the street to come through in a city dressed for evening or earthquake. Neon knocks, but refuses to enter. Imagination is a yardstick. The sun is a dead center, pitiful eye, inheritor of vain insistence, take heed. The horse running by is not that of a different color. It's the rider who changes, trades his orange and black satins. November, I'm sorry, October is over for street clothes. He says it's a marvelous thing to be watched. The pleasure is enormous. He says we are each a metaphor. Met a mega dose of our own making, an almost in the off and running. In November, a barrel of monkeys was dropped onto an unruffled incline. By June, it had come to a halt. Some called it time, others argued compulsion. I stumble because I haven't read these poems in so very long, 21 years. How did that happen? Okay. In the book of all that's befallen, there were 118 miniatures, index and prologue, blue and vermilion, all bound arabesque, a single edition with a map at the back, a map of Mundi, de millennio, with five fish in a fountain, a forest of fern taking root and cherries galore. The text, pure art, part drawn with water, part taut repetition with a twist of sediment, particles floating on the surface like ice flows facing extinction in the matte shadow of a hot four o'clock. Tom, it means twin, don't you know? What train ride, she asked, can escape what's befallen? What lark in a riverside park can sing us up out of this pit? Knowledge was knowing what would happen. The fire was a case of negligence, unleashing the literal edge of a glacier and ergo the flood. The air was thick with switches. She said, said she, all had befallen and someone was sobbing. This title, The Downstream Extremity of the Isle of the Swans comes from um, a Beckett play, The Ohio Impromptu, which is a 15 minute play. And um, it's someone is reading a book to someone else and perhaps the divided self. And um, they're talking about um, mourning and um, that they should have stayed where they were at the downstream extremity of the Isle of Swans. Now, this poem on the page, as you can see, is um, uh, in Roman type and then in italics. And so if you're reading it on the page, you're able to read the italics separately. So I'm actually going to read the Roman and then I'm going to come back because going between them, it makes making sense very difficult. In the window, a jacket cried, wear me, wear me, on a street of tall houses, all showing teeth ash white of ice rut, of water on rock, many their eyes, all shaded by marmalade hoods, O oh, cobra. I was foreign then, living in a limited range, disavowal, lodged here and there. Everyone was saying, oh, I would never, I would never. At night, opera wind raked through a field of hollow reeds, the song of disquiet dogs from doomsday's third circle. The raging distemper finally forced me to breed 
a new brand of silence, the singlet before it is discus, discus, doublet. We meet again, Moriarty, one said to the mirror in the morning, one said to the friend on the street. See how all that has been amended, though nothing attenuates the hour of late gray, spittled rain, slip chain and bolt, the nights in a family of dreams, slaughter of heathen, falcon-headed henchmen. What was you that I stood waiting for sky to become chintz over Swiss, dot after dot measuring an immense span of glass mouth tasting the burnt sun, the black sea, heart thumping behind its insensible hoof. And then I'll go back and read the, the ital. In the distance was a sapphire city, part early invention, part aviary. Everything depended on perspective. A viper's tongue could upend such a place. A blown leaf could bury each and every Embassy and chancellery, shop and legation, gone. To what? A gash, a flat field, a field as far as the eye could see. And who would know? Who would know it had ever been? This next poem I was um, I was looking at this morning in preparation of reading it and remembered that um, I was on a train going between New York and Boston and watching things go out the window and I was reading Freud. So I don't know how this poem came out of that, but those were the circumstances. When meeting beauty, what must we do? Nothing is clear. Not sense of room swept the sky, raising dust clouds, drizzling grit down to veil our small minds. Something seen against a gravestone, something with a deadly center. In the center of November, a dog bows its head and howls. Leaves cling to the fences, faux diamonds. What isn't dead is dying. Everywhere the eye discovers fortune, take it on faith. A gray stone adhered to green lichen, like the skull with its spare coat of reason. A wall succumbs to its brick, at the brink, 14 windows, three tiers. It fascinates, this glass triangulation, sky, window, and witch. Can you tell me, Marco Polo, is this gray butter dish a bridge or a narrow waterway, a lock, or the long door behind which everything comes clean? I need to know if only as a forewarning of weather, as a possible key to the forecourt of heaven, what can be counted upon? Now back to the exhausted topic. The Constant Bride. Do you understand the concept, the marvel, tender at the neck, shoulder at turn, water freezes like this, bent and ready to thaw. We're entering the realm of winter, but this is the exciting, awful now. Remember dancing, audacity's threat that it could make us fall? Both body and soul have been sewn, stripped to the lining, seam to seam. Needle curved, minuscule stitch, pearls furrow the bodice, hives adhered. Then there's the bangles, the serpentine garter wrapping the calf. Oh, decision, with which word will vary now link arms. The bridal veil draped on the bed, worn it would turn to a rustle of besotted birds. That night, the mechanical garden, the lynch gate, a hinged iris, and only one wish from which to choose, sleep and may she never wake. A case of asymmetry. In this case, the right eye sees better than the left 
yet not enough to rapture a glimpse of the Hudson gleaned between two trees or to have augured what would come of this telephone all its curious kiss. Last night, an ice cream dream where three flannel mice grew dauntingly larger and less and less gray. Morning was equally surreal, but lifelike and fused. Someone too free with her utterances, stopping to ask, you do believe me, don't you, dearie? Freud makes much of the mice and never forgetting. The man is mad as the body is sick by nature. Meanwhile, passion's falcon refuses the wrist and dim hood and takes to the forest instead in search of attachment equally morbid, muddled, and cruel. When the sun's hot on the face of two places, it's never an equal divide. No and not was all she heard. Poor I, she said, from the off-center door of her head. And you can tell by the mention of the Hudson, this was written in New York, which is where I was living when um, these poems were written before I was exiled like Dante to the prairie. <clears throat> the mouth in clarity is criminal to itself. Add to silence the human and not only the throat, anatomical suctions and removals, but the impulse of a woman letting down her long hair or a girl mourning in a glass of milk, tired the eyes, ragged the nails and chipped. Tell me a story of a second floor floor that couldn't be cleaner, a house that wouldn't fit back in its box, but succeeded in eating its way to the edge of a lot. The system is what we pay for, brown of burnt copper coating the, the eve, the ease, and a rococo wreath ringing the circular window inside an untimely now coming back at the end to an aisle of red-vested archers, to wit, to woo, certain, what does it mean? To be most urgent, a moral generosity, a discarded modesty, leaping from the page to break into the heart of a choice. <clears throat> Dull love or lovely opulence, O oh, flamingo. Um, let's skip that one and on this late stage. She said, it's true, my turtle dove, trucks do roll on the highway in the pie and tigers will imbibe their own stripes if thirst requites, requites it. Rebelief is a tender trick, but if you can touch the object, can see the scarf that muffles the score of an engine, and yes, yellow means more than mere cowardice, although it's a cupboard co color, if ever there was one. Now, don't you believe the taxi man, the Amalfi, doesn't really mean mafia. We can eat anywhere you wish, and we can drink any little rivulet that washes our way. We're just fine living in an unlabeled box where the blonde puffs her cheeks on the beach of a truffle pig's ear and throws us a look every once in a while. Doubtless, she thinks she knows us. She knows us not at all. And this will be the last poem. The what within. In this sober domain, the first girl's name was Cookie. The Brun had no name now and wanted one. She went by Honey. She went by My Little Lamb. She went by the last to enter the boat. She went by. It is not a deficiency, not a coarse necessity. It's good, she said, to enter a circular road, a festive occasion. The blonde disputed nothing. She was old fashioned. She had features, but her ticks were becoming unraveled. Can such an assault be avoided? And if so, how? To get closer to sensation, the two women pressed against a third possibility, Eidos. 
Certain things are undeniable, jug, axe, a pair of shoes, impenetrable, sufficiently hard, elastic while firm. The blonde wore red shoes, soles made of leather and the upper surface made of leather, cobbled by thread and nails, glue. What will you preserve? Only, see fig, a simple something, a Simon. Whatever we are at home with, nearness, exact determination, strife. The Brun, Brun said, you have your norm. The blonde felt she didn't, not really. She had refusal, privation. She preserved the dis of distance in two modes. She had deeds. But did she have direction? Did she have design? I'm made of wood, she said, and warped. Thank you so much. Did you want to speak to me? I didn't know whether I should disappear into the ether immediately or what. No, I'd like to just say, it's possible. I guess you stay on there. Yes, of course. Sorry. I think I, I was supposed to speak into this microphone, okay? So we'd like you to stay on and follow the rest of the reading if you care to. Well, I, I'd like to follow the rest of the reading, but I'll click my um, picture off and I'll okay. just. Listen. Okay. But Dr. thank Lee. you again. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you once again. <laughs> okay, I think we continue with our poetry reading after this beautiful start. And I'd like to see Maria Grazia Calandrone. Come right here, Maria Grazia. Welcome to New York. Welcome to New York. Okay. I think you have to speak into this microphone, right? Okay, I'm going to sit over there. Before reading, I. I'd like to thank you, Luigi Ballerini, Casa Italiana, uh, Zarilli Marimo, and this institute for the invitation. Uh, for me, it's uh, like a dream. But <laughs> in this room, there are my daughter and my son that uh, speak English better than me. I, I quit. <laughs> I stop with my horrible English and I read in, uh, in poetry. Seme. Hai una debolezza di spiga, muscoli di cavalla, un'orsura di sabbia calpestata, nella spina dorsale un solco di aratura, la solitudine di una bestia santa all'angolo destro della bocca dove un'intelligenza appena nata ti sfiora, quasi senza svegliarti. Metti il dito nel solco del tuo cuore, indicami, scopri la crepa tua da dove stilla il mio sangue sulla foresta dei simboli, e nel sonno che specie di amore trabocchi sugli oggetti intorno, quanto eccede, la misura del corpo finisce. Per agire tra i legamenti elettrici del mondo come la bruciatura del neutro, l'inizio dell'anonimo, poggia con tutto il peso sulla terra straniera del tuo corpo, per favore non dirlo, chiudi la bocca, perché il tuo occhio destro sfiora le acque di un mare sepolto, Seme profondamente rovo e corona di specie sconosciuta, apertamente tace come bronzo, cammina nel presente come in un tempio, come nella memoria, finché dal fondo del teatro del mare una creatura adulta disarmata si alza in piedi, cede al tuo perdono. Fossile Metti una mano qui come una benda bianca, chiudimi gli occhi, colma la soglia di benedizioni dopo che sei passata attraverso l'oro verde dell'iride come un'ape regale e pagliuzza su pagliuzza d'oro e grano trebbiato hai fatto di me il tuo favo di luce. 
una costellazione di api ruota sul tiglio con saggezza inumana, un vorticare di intelligenze non si stacca dall'albero del miele. Sarebbe riduttivo dire amore questa necessità della natura, mentre un vuoto anteriore rimargina tra fiore e fiore senza lasciare traccia. Usa la bocca, sfilami dal cuore il pungiglione d'oro, la memoria di un lampo che ha bruciato la mia forma umana in una qualche preistoria, dove i pazzi accarezzano le pietre come fossero teste di bambini. Avvicinati, come la prima tra le cose perdute, e quel volto si leva dalla pietra per sorridere ancora. Rinasce non ha io. Io riconosco la tua bianca soma, la tua bellezza di animale nero, ti slego tutti i filamenti vivi finché sei tutta nuova, splendi nell'erba come una mela appena fatta, sei la luce dell'alba e sei la mela e il gesto semplice della ratura. Maschio, femmina, ombra, riconosco qui sulle labbra il punto esatto dell'interruzione. Senti, la nostalgia della preda fuori dall'umida masticazione della tua bocca coperta d'oro e sali d'altura e alla destra il fulmine, lo scisma, qualcosa come un gemito. Sugli occhi ho il carico di tutto questo cielo mosso e grave di tarda primavera, ho il dolore di avere regnato su un regno abbandonato. Così la scimmia edenica si stacca per te e scende dalla fermezza botanica del bosco, Cresce dall'orizzonte allo scoperta aumentata ed esposta, spicca dall'aria i frutti tutto miele delle parole, tesse il ponte del ricongiungimento non finalizzato a produrre che ricongiungimento. Parola su parola forgia la lancia del tuo compimento, ti mette a punto come un ingranaggio di cantiere navale so sotto la macina del sole e i vettori neri delle avi un risveglio di rondini sul canale di taglio, sulle spallette bianche di cemento, fitte di reti dentro, guizza argenteo il pescato, un raccolto d'uranio e pallore di sirene platoniche. L'animale infierisce, non cede, non si converte, scintilla, martella, fonde, sta fabbricando e carsico, desidera consegnarti parola per parola il mondo tutto spaccato dalla tua eruzione, soggiogato e percosso dal tallone del semidio desidera posarti nei palmi come una mela rossa l'infuocata bellezza di questo mondo, gocciolante dell'amnio del paradiso non fa che dire prendilo, era tuo. Per Alba L'anima mia è un dio umano, un uccello d'altura, che ogni notte nidifica nel chiaro del tuo petto come un endecasillabo perfetto, cosa bianca e copiosa, ala sottile, rosa e roveto, cenere, parva tra stelle profuse, bianco sangue di spugna tubolare, nel bianco planetario, bianca tigre, seduta ai bordi della bianca strada senza dolore. L'anima mia cresce dalle tue ossa, come una rosa da una lingua viva a stille, a emorragia dal tuo alfabeto inimmaginabile. Ma è da questo corpo, dalla sua silenziosa mietitura, che viene il verbo, questo pane assoluto che ti offro, questa bellezza viva, fatta per te. The last one. Albero fossile. Verrai nutrita a lungo, avanti nel tempo della vita, dai frutti di un melo preistorico. In un futuro aprile ti innalzerai, con la spina dorsale spinta da una linfa nuova. Ricorderai la dolcezza dell'albero che non voleva morire e ributtava e rifioriva ogni volta che lo tagliavi. Girerai indietro la testa, Allungherai la mano, la bella mano che con tale dolcezza accarezzava i rami aperti del melo e mangerai. Allora tornerò nella tua bocca con la leggerezza della luce e ancora 
Al calor bianco del nostro tempo estivo mangerai la mela che ha pescato al fondo del tempo, il frutto rosso e gonfio come un'arteria che scorre dalla mia vita alla tua vita, ma lontano, ma sotto, là dove non arriva la ragione, nei luoghi inarrestabili. Dimentica l'albero, non pensare più a niente, soffiami via, che resti solo vita per la tua vita. wondering. Luckily I know some Italian so I could uh, not quite follow the English up there. Thank you very much Maria Grazia. Now uh, I'd like to call uh, Vincenzo Frungillo. <laughs> An old Milanese Neapolitan friend. We, uh, you're a polyde. <laughs> We shared an introduction by Elio Pagliarani, of which I think we are both very proud of. Yes. Sure. And uh, again, some of these poems that are reading Mary Jo's and uh, Maria Grazia are, are not necessarily written yesterday, uh, but uh, you know we had to translate, and so some translations were done relatively uh, recently and others were done a little bit later but eventually when we when we publish the proceeding we try to come to a date line that will uh, represent the poets at a particular given moment of their career so once again I mean I think you're reading from Ogni uh, Cinque Bracciate I don't know if you want to say what the title is uh, yes, if you don't I, mind I can I see, I see some fingers my fingers Okay, okay, very good, okay. So I'm going to take it. Okay, good evening to you, and um, um, I, would, uh, I would like, um, I would like to thank, uh, excuse me, I, I, I am ambition, uh, a little bit uh, emozionato, ecco. <laughs> so, uh, I, I wrote something uh, for um, this occasion. I would like to thank Luigi for the invitation and uh, Casa Zerilli Marimo and uh, Casa della Cultura. I read from a text published in 2009, Every Five Strokes, which start writing at the age of 29 in 2002. This text is a, an, an octavic epic about the East German women women really who won the Moscow Olympics in, two, in 1918. The bodies of these women were subjected to state doping experiments. So, when, when I wrote this um, book, I, I think this um, this text, uh, maybe not for my voice, but uh, a voice of a, an actor. So, <laughs> but I tried to, to read. Dal piede gocciola, il tempo della memoria. In cerchi regolari d'acqua e di cloro, uteri apre lo spazio della storia. Stanca ai bordi della vasca, ripensa a loro che le indicarono la traiettoria, una via di fuga dalla miseria, urlando in coro, in un moto di gioia, con la spinta delle nostre braccia, abbatteremo questa enorme gabbia. Gridavano in faccia allo spray rosso, sui mattoni primordiali del più alto muro, le bambina si caricò quell'urlo addosso e decise per sé, l'impegno più duro salverò queste voci dal puzzo di piscio io posso, le porterò con me in un posto libero, sicuro. Farò di me stessa il loro corpo, farò dei miei gesti il loro volo. Senza il pregiudizio della parte sbagliata, ora nuota nell'acqua azzurra della piscina, trasparente a se stessa, affilata nella bracciata, sulla superficie che brilla come di brina, ascolta i tonfi dell'acqua tagliata e segna nella tempia il ritmo della vita. Nessuna sconfitta ora, nessuna vittoria, lei decide in centesimi di secondo la sua storia, 
Ute sa di essere la più brava e s'allena senza sosta, tre ore al mattino, tre ore la sera, il suo corpo cresce, s'adegua la lena e muta quei giorni la forma che era esile ossuta sotto il biondo pallido della pena, ma non scompare sotto gli occhi la cera tesa d'una bambina che brucia lenta quando è sola, guarda chi chiacchiera e non s'allena. Ute è severa con se stessa, con quelli che restano a terra, e non capisco la necessità di una mano a pinna di chi sotto il petto la resistenza dell'acqua afferra le severa con se stessa e s'affina contro l'immota casualità della sua terra. Si sente aliena, ma decisa, contro la massa che la mina. Ute l'azzurra testimonianza d'una promessa, il corpo cristallo liquido di campionessa. Si potenza nella squadra la voglia di vittoria, nella sola compagnia che le è dovuta, a staffetta s'alterna con chi ha la stessa euforia. C'è l'ampe che ha qualcosa che ha avuto e sconosciuta, la gioia lineare della vita, lo stimolo della gloria. L'ampe agli occhi di tutti il benvoluto, non è solo Ute che nota il chiarore della sua pelle, la sua elasticità aggressiva, ribelle, mentre la guarda volare sopra la sua testa, stesa nei muscoli della coscia, perfetta quando entra in acqua e ad un quarto di vasca s'arresta ed inizia la sequenza di farfalla e svetta tra le braccia inarcate e la cresta di schiuma azzurrina, la sua schiena eretta. Fuori dall'acqua a volte c'è la vita, ma poi scompare ed Ute si sente finita. A suoi occhi l'ampe non è mai passiva, né quando parla con un'altra compagna, né quando rida senza alibi e furtiva ritorna a se stessa al costume che la bagna, lo scosta per far uscire l'aria. E poi tardiva lo spogliatoio a chi paziente l'accompagna. L'ampe come l'acqua, prestante la sua assenza, dolce e irraggiungibile, la sua evidenza. Il silenzio è il solo che reclama. Nel tendone vuoto fanno eco le grida per chi non ha qualcuno che la chiama nei piccoli vortici d'acqua, nell'aria inumidita, il giorno riannoda la sua trama. Chi resta subisce il peso della sfida sulla lingua e nel naso dover di nuovo sentire la paura e l'ansia di chi non vuole uscire. I palazzi contengono i giorni, i giorni, e giorni, di visi, di luci, di annunci sullo strassen ban registrate, di nuchi e di ritorni, di stazioni, con pilastri e rifiuti, e tu che non rinunci, di serrande abbassate su negozi di vestiti e di contorni di neve sporca, e tu che pronunci con gli occhi come unici amici vicini in questa parte di città, sono alienati persino i manichini. E now the, the first, um, second capture is about uh, Renate. Renate is uh, Dorsista, of, of, uh, I don't know in English. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Ai lati del sole ci sono reperti da altri mondi, come satelliti, consigli, indicazioni da raggi scoperti. I silenzi dei padri ricadranno sui figli. Profetizzavano i nonni paterni durante i pomeriggi continui sbadigli quando un velo sulla pupilla nasconde a tutti ciò che brilla. Una puttana ha notato i suoi capelli bianchi è stata la prima standogli sopra. Gliel'ha detto con gli occhi stanchi, qui nella tempia vuoi che li copra? Ha spinto più forte con i fianchi evitando qualsiasi parola, voleva renderlo muto, un senza nome lui ha goduto. Ha la memoria ampia quanto il dolore, vive un guasto della rimozione, tutto è visto con gli occhi del torpore mentre versa acqua ai piedi della nazione. Giura sul suo onore, ripete che la sua opinione, dice d'appartenere al corpo sociale, anche se non ne sente i sintomi nella carne. Con metafore da meccanico espone teorie profetiche, parla di regole come porte antipanico, perché le masse sono isteriche, manovrabili con il sadico richiamo alla minaccia nucleare e ricatto della psiche che spinge a scappare da se stessi per porre il partito a controllare gli ingressi. Quel voto l'ha catturato, tenuto lontano, impegnato in troppe discussioni dove nessuno offre la pietà d'una mano, ma solo il riverbero dei suoni che mette un uomo insano. Ripete che la storia è come i tuoni, squarci improvvisi che illuminano i cieli, e poi il buio, dietro, dietro quei chiari veli. Renate lo vede seduto sul suo ventre con l'aria impassibile di chi assente, di chi ingoia la storia, mentre canta l'inno alla patria del perdente e ritira ad uno ad uno i suoi per sempre. La sua testa, come un salice piangente, 
cade nel golfo di braccia che cattura quiete. Questa è la, tombe, la tomba dell'eroe, il suo lete. I nazisti avevano solchi nella roccia per i loro riti ariani, vi dormivano per ore e ho solo le mie braccia, guarda Renate quanto sono porose, le sponde di questo mare si allargano come macchia, vi potrei annegare. Le sue pose sono la prova di un silenzio ulteriore, la promessa di un nuovo dolore. Il padre passa dalla risata esterica che riempie l'occhio con una lacrima serietà di una predica contro il regime dell'assenza, perché prima la Germania era un corpo di forma sferica, tutto confluiva come in una rima. La legge della nazione era la sua pienezza. Tutto preparava la nostra estrema magrezza. Catturata allora in una forma di tepore, le si vede tra, tra la folla con addosso niente, coperta solo dal suo rossore. Non siamo una specie paziente, anche se viviamo contando le ore, amiamo il nostro niente. Solo così possiamo fondare un regime in tempo di pace. Bisogna svanire. Così non è mai stata archiviata la sua profezia, né Renata ha smesso di sentirsi nuda. È andata anche da lei la polizia per chiederle del padre, della sua fuga, le ha sussurrato, io non sono una spia. Ma è come se fosse rimasta muta. Il padre non è più stato ritrovato e con lui è sparito il corpo d'ogni reato. Mio padre si soffiava nella conca delle mani. Si strappava la pelle dalla bocca. Dicevano che aveva una forma d'ansia per il domani, che prima o poi la depressione tutti tocca. Se vivi osservando l'ombra che mangia i divani, se resti a guardare come il suo spazio trabocca. Mio padre però ci ha provato, lo diceva sempre che se ne sarebbe andato. Lo dicevo asputando veleno a mia madre quando tornava dal turno serale. Un tempo portava zollette di zucchero ordinate a squadre con sopra ogni volta la figura di un diverso animale e poi ha smesso di ridere mio padre, ha iniziato a stare male. Lo hanno preso due volte rannicchiato come uno straccio vecchio nel filo spinato. Non ha chiesto scusa, non ha pianto, è rimosto come un bambino a fissare il soffitto. A volte mi parlava di suo padre, di quanto aveva sofferto vedendolo morire afflitto del suo stesso male, ma lui non aveva pianto, aveva solo pensato che non era stato sconfitto, che non era vero, mio padre era un mito, mio padre era fatto di granito. Poi un giorno ha iniziato ad usare la mia mano come tassi di un solfeggio immaginario, come le tavole per i conti di un antico romano, lasciava che i giorni scendessero come granelli di un lunario tra i suoi polpastrelli e il dorso della mia mano. Ha contato, ha contato temerario, stringendo le labbra tra i denti. Ha scontato con pazienza il destino dei perdenti. Mio padre se n'è andato, magro e sbiadito, senza un malanno preciso, è morto senza un grido, sfinito, stringendo il suo pugno nel mio deciso. Mio padre forse è fuggito. Qualcuno ha detto che, come se si fosse ucciso, mio padre mi ha lasciato dentro solo un gran rimorso, per questo ad ogni, ad ogni gara. Stringo le mie labbra in un morso. <coughs> Renate stringe le labbra. È lei la più ostinata e spinge sotto il mento le ginocchia pronta per la sequenza d'andata. Parte narcando il corpo nell'aria, schiocca, rafferma la piscina dalla tensione imbalsamata, si stende poi da pura dorsista e adocchia il suo punto di gravità nell'aria, svolta nella virata verso la vittoria, tocca. Intuisce su di lei il volo della ranista, riverbera nell'acqua l'urlo della folla e prima, ma Carla è già protagonista, raccoglie bacini d'acqua tra le gambe, rolla gli arti, dando potenza al busto che sbircia la pista e sola, fa semicerchi con le braccia e crolla sott'acqua distesa come un'anguilla, svolta, si alza, si rituffa, al traguardo, brilla, tocca. La farfalla vola, svetta, lampe, organizza la vasca intorno al bacino, si alza, poderosa, come un'onda e netta, affonda l'ala che diventa un uncino. Quando sott'acqua arpiona la massa ed in fretta la rilascia per dare spazio alla coda del delfino. Una sintesi perfetta che diventa pura armonia quando svolta, a traguardo, s'avvia, tocca, ute libera, di stendere le braccia, di snodare la spalla, di spezzare con la mano la retta, d'afferrare il tempo in una morsa d'aria, nei polmoni, nella bocca, nella stretta di petto, di gomito, d'afferrare la storia per una frazione di secondo, nella fretta del suo abbraccio, tutti i volti hanno pazienza, trovano rifugio, sospesi ogni oltre, oltre ogni scadenza. Ute è libera. Finalmente libera di vedere le compagne in rivolta festeggiare chi ha spezzato la loro cera, 
la figura che ha vissuto una sola volta in un altro mondo, in un'altra era, come se la sua non fosse la stessa volta del cielo che avvolge gli spalti e la piscina come se non toccasse mai terra, non dovesse arrivare prima. Grazie. another online connection I uh, see they will get chatting okay cool see, oh, okay so she's not gonna be there right okay see, see. no no yeah you could put her on but I mean no no don't don't uh, Rosemary Waldrop uh, was unable to come for very serious reasons which you can imagine and when these gentlemen have done speaking, I will continue. Thank you. As I said, uh, she cannot be with us, but uh, I think she's one of the most important voices of American poetry today. She's also a person who worked for poetry, and uh, she and her husband, Keith Waldrop, for many years ran a very important publishing venue called Burning Deck. From <laughs> for a moment, I thought I'd forgotten. Well, um, I remember Charles Bernstein and Rosemary Waldrop and John Ashbery and Amiri Baraka and others at Milano Poesia. It must have been a few years back. But, uh, well, uh, as I said, uh, she was very kind and decided to record her performance for us. And therefore, Julian is now going to activate the contraption here and we'll have Rosemary Waldrop and although she won't be able to hear us I suppose I think we should give her a big round of applause just the same I'm sorry I cannot be with you in person and I want to thank Luigi for including me at least in this way. And I'll begin with four poems from the sequence Impossible Object, uh, which takes off from Nicholas Mosley's novel of the same name. Object Relations How differently our words drift across danger or rush toward a lover meaning married to always different coordinates. I married a foreigner in one sense. In another, no word fits with another. Your smile breaks from any point of your body. I need a more complicated picture. This one falls among crow's feet and bears no fruit. What did it try? Replace your body? My doubts stand in a circle around us, like visitors around the well under the house. They advise to board it up, dampness unhinges, and decay of fish. It would mean all night, hands scraped on rough surmise, remembering I too am a monster. The objective character of statements has shifted to relations boiling water and the length of a column of mercury, or that you mean me when you say you. When I say we were standing close, am I saying we were not touching? To replace a laugh, which could be described as wish, yellowish fish. What if there is no well? What if language is not communication? If facts refuse coordinates, detachment vanishes as if thinned. Meaning you consists in thinking of your body. There are no fish in my mouth. We will always ask what happened. Imagine a witch in the form of a naked girl. Now say her name. Is it foreign? 
Was the idea of the witch complete before you named the girl? Did you go down a passage that does not exist for the well of dark water? Your mind makes small rudimentary motions because the joke is against it, because it does not know which way to turn and keeps reviewing the field of possible action, aches, actresses. I hear you sighing. Intention is neither an emotion nor yet lip sync of longing. It is not a state of consciousness. It does not have genuine duration. I say, are you all right? Can you have an intention intermittently, abandon it like a soldier paralyzed the moment before battle, and resume it? Could I order you to understand the sentence, just as I could tell you to run forward into the fire? Would the understanding cast a shadow on the wall, even though a premonition is not a bullet hole? One symptom is that space is forced into a mirror, as if the event stood in readiness behind the silver. You move your hand and it goes the other way. Then the earth opens up and you slide down your darkest desires. Witches were killed by fire, by water, by hanging in air, burying in earth, by asphyxiation, penetration, striking, piercing, crushing in a thousand and one ways. What was the name you gave her? Intentionalities. My hand moves along your thigh. When we describe intention, is the ventriloquist taken over by the dummy or pretending to be a ghost? Instead, of, I meant you, I could say, we walked through wet streets toward a dark well. But could I speak of you this way? And why does it sound wrong to say, I meant you, by pulling away, like lovers caught in headlights? If I talk of you, it connects me to you, by an infinite of betweens, not by touching you in the dark. Touch is the sense I place outside myself for you to write. When I mean you, I may show it, if we stand close, by putting my head on your shoulder. You can show you understand by describing the well under the trap door. What will you say? Don't be frightened. The feeling I have when I mean you draws an arc of strength between my hips and the small of my back. It doesn't follow that meaning you is being exhilarated by terror. Of course not, you say. We need a red thread to run through, but it's entangled with space, form, future. Is this true? It would be wrong to say that meaning you stands for a forgotten part of myself, a treatise on labyrinths, a path leading nowhere. Am I living in a shell where the sea comes in along with its sound and drowns us? I was speaking of you because I wanted to think about you. I want it does not describe a general before battle, nor, on the other hand, a ship heading for shipwreck. There's no way to decide whether this is an autobiography or a manifesto. Enhanced Density should it worry me that thought in my sentences seems never wholly present at any one moment, let alone love in my life? Even my skin has no precise shape that is unless touched by clothes. There seems a brownish mist under construction from forest fires. My feeling for you seems to flow like traffic under my skin. I wanted to break through the pores and touch you, inflict wounds so small you don't know what's killing you. 
the way a word can pierce because of the use it has had in your life, because it comes out of a deep well, because war follows the opening of mouths. You are never in front of me like an object. And if I try to hold you sideways, the melody slips away, leaving a single note, like a reflection in a shifting mirror, a phoneme escaping between the sutures of my accent. What can I do but let my thoughts roam in the field around a bird, the way desire roams through my body? It's called the meaning of the word because we cannot touch the groundwater in any other way. Are we making an object when we make love? Do we hope it'll stay in front of us and allow us to observe it? It may not be enough to look at the surface I love or parts adjacent. And now I would like to read Time Ravel, which is a sequence of eight, I think. Yes, eight parts. Time Ravel. One. With the mind's eye, we see against the light, the way we see the dead. My father reading at his desk. Read, road, door. Remains unclear how my brain chose to store this image rather than another, or how it veers toward the surface. Ulysses fights his way back to an Ithaca with four-lane highways, where serfdom has been replaced by alienation, anomie, anxiety. Returns, reverts, replies. A borrowed book, the sword to its scabbard, in recompense, response. Two. The assumption is that the sirens have drowned in the alphabet and been replaced by warnings, war, warp. My father stopped reading to watch a magpie rising black and white against the sky. Memories are many, glitter in the brain, ready to be pilfered. Does this fit my image of the real? where the norms of social interaction have multiplied and spontaneous acts come back as a mistake or combustion? Natural feeling, temperament, disposition, impulse, energy, all lashed fast to the mast, the rubrics of the dictionary meaning business. 3. Columbus crew were afraid they would not come back, unable to close the loop time won't permit, but sometimes a ghost or shifting winds. Or the memory of a big slab of ice that a man with leather mittens splits across the middle to reveal the time hidden within where I might not find my body for the cold. And so my mother wraps the slab in a rag before putting it in the icebox. It would not warm me enough to have a self. Same identical, interest, confidence, esteem, reliance, respect. Skin, so it takes pains to remember caresses, is marked by the road that pain takes. Four. Color of fables, the Indies, scarves, curves. Every island Columbus found was a vow kept for the map with no elsewhere. High spirits and cloud theory reflect in the sea and stitch coordinates toward a flight of gulls, of stairs. America becomes a continent while numbers pass through the air, soar out of bounds, or run from danger, flicker of fear. How can I remember my parents if I need to run my hands over my body to make sure it is there? Or lean forward to brace against our element, deflect its head-on force into a more general time, where God, for love of us, wears clothes. Five. 
I can't hear my father's voice, moored as if among antibodies, articulation hindered by head, head hanging down and a spill of oceans. Spell, sperm, spatter, splash. If the mechanisms of subjectivity are disturbed, it requires total restructuring of the world. As when I first learned that the earth turns on its axis, that spleen, noun, is a highly vascular ductless gland which serves to produce certain changes in the blood. <coughs> Merriment, obsolete, caprice, spite, anger, malice, moroseness, melancholy. Most marked in complex uh, civilizations, where the pace of events and cordless voices exceeds all the running one can do just to stay in one place. So silver on clear days is the light. <coughs> Six. In haste we now blast ourselves beyond the clouds and get lost in skies behind the sky. It's hard to rescue time from such a sight. And so they cast a shadow. Perspective has no power over clouds. Bodies without surface. They vanish the moment before the move into abstraction. The way my mother's large body evaporates before I can ask her to show me the breast I did not take. Columbus, though, Magellan, Vasco, in the name of Christ and King, took firm hold of new markets. A mirror for a parrot, scissors for cinnamon, a playing card for a girl naked to the waist, a kingdom for a horse. And dust in everyone's eyes for private purchase and sale. What does it mean to recall the past if I have little sense of the present? Seven. Names multiplied in the wake of caravels, clippers, communicating vessels. The spelling capricious sees plain as the winds. Track itineraries, track vanished and erased, track how many pages between Circe's island and Charybdis. It is not that our sensations need to match images in the brain, but that the brain needs a body for frame of reference. No matter if it be squat or can't, short, squ short, square, parts fitted together to enclose a window, door, picture, or disposition of the mind. Just as emotion shows, if we are ready for the future hovering at the edge of our eye. Great beginnings, too can end up a small world, quarrel, old. Set sail on the power of imagination for hearsay geographies and real dangers, with greed as secret motor. It drove them back home to cities crazy for spices and gold. In between, waves and more waves. When I think of my mother, I am heavy in the pelvis for the children she wanted, and begin to sing. A complex song of if and so I never had a voice. To introduce an exclamation, condition, stipulation, untenable argument or wish. On condition, in the event that allowing that these long-term memories are abstractions, a different mode of thought from short-term ones and that their differences shape my sense of time. A violet's blue as a sign of distance. Thank you. Okay, we conclude this uh, round of poetry readings with Laura Liberale.
Uh, we met for the first time on this occasion. So this is uh, a great opportunity for me and for most of us. We have had old friends, middle friends, and new friends. And, uh, but all of them are the incipients of a long friendship anyway. So without further ado, and uh, here is Laura Liberale, whose book, uh, I'm proud to say, will be released by Agincourt in a matter of days. I was hoping to give you a present, uh, but we failed. Okay. <laughs> Thanks to all for invitation. Sono molto emozionata e I read from my third book, La disponibilità della nostra carne. All'esatto giro di lunazioni, il corpo diviso a metà, il tuo prima e tutto il dopo, la nebride di pelle bianca, la traslucida pelle del figlio, lui venne a pascolare sulle ceneri le bestie urlanti del panico. Qualcuno disse, pensavi forse non avesse un prezzo? Ci assedieranno i fianchi prosciugati, mai orbitando al di sopra dello sterno, sbatteranno ancora e ancora contro il pube api di pura volontà, ogni volta cercando nel miele di un nuovo coito la disponibilità della nostra carne. Calca i tuoi passi da quando gettasti nel pozzo gli occhi, la rosso vestita, la sua lingua a lambire la terra per il peso delle morte parole, nel vaso rotto le placente insepolte, la lama celata per pietà e in nessun luogo si staccherà da te la coppia di teschi biglie d'osso che le dita scorrono come un rosario. Nelle acque di dentro vi immergo, nel tumulto dell'acqua corporea, nel guado che toglie il respiro e lo ricongiunge il respiro, nelle pozze del ventre vi annego, nel tremendo, nel nero dell'acqua, a uno solo in quest'acqua il respiro. Per noi che battevamo i denti nei nostri letti fu la visitazione delle pallide, gli orri di piedi volti all'indietro, il velame di pelle, le braccia tese al sangue che ci sgorgava dai capezzoli. Il Dio che sciolse le acque nel sonno si introdusse a compiervi rovina. Non ti poteva bastare fissare i precipizi, la tromba delle scale, i buchi nella terra, i pozzi, le voragini, né invocarlo il vuoto. La polpa già cantava, tenace, infinitesimo, tremore. Non ne deponesti pezzi in una giara di miele dopo aver battuto il ventre. Nessuna bestia gridò ominosa contro l'alba, ma la nera lei restò a guardarti sanguinare con il suo filo di teste a ornamento della gola. Ricostituiscimi, ripete chi fu fatto a pezzi al fuoco volto a mezzogiorno che diede al sangue un battito marziale. A me restituiscimi. E il sangue si abbandona al proprio sperpero, si dissipa impotente. Certe donne credono che solidificandosi il sangue possa generare un figlio. Fra tutte le stanze è questa la verde degenza sororale che germina mancanze, recisioni e il vostro tempo accorpa nell'ora guasta. Vi scandirà da adesso carne miliare, minuscoli, cippi, vermigli. In un sonno senza sogni tace la doglia dei padri. Fu cotto il loro seme, rugginose le vulve come pietre d'altare. In questa cattedrale d'Occidente, tollerata soltanto nella visione futuribile di una fagocitosi vegetale, qui dove l'umano si oblia e l'unigenita viene festeggiata da serpentine liquide e vertigini, ti appaiono anche loro pallidi androgini adolescenti, 
sillabano sfocati parole al di là della tua comprensione. Lo sguardo dice il tradimento dell'acqua. Non fuori le pareti dello scempio, ma dentro, in cavità d'organo, perciò con lei hai temuto una meccanica di onde, il propagarsi senza tempo del male sul velo d'ammio, la carne di entrambe rivendicata dagli spettri. Ancora stai chiedendo di nutrirla, di celebrare il rito della cura, è un'ara questo tavolo, tu scava due solchi, riempili di acqua, latte e acqua, zolle di terra innalza far barriera, erigi il tumulo, l'orto racchiuso, liba nel sole che strina i contorni, nella misura della primavera. La madre è il leone nero che infrange unghiate la cupola dell'infanzia. Sapere è bucare la luce, aprire varchi d'ombra. Questi pezzi disseminati sono l'ultima misura del danno. All'orecchio del moribondo, perché nelle orecchie degli estirpati sia versata la riconciliazione, All'orecchio del moribondo hai soffiato l'inassolvibile, mormorato ciò che non può niente sulla loro ininterrotta ascesa al ventre, aggrappati ai lacci delle tue scarpe, niente sulla loro pretesa di compimento. And the last one, one uh, surprise, uh, to finish a test not yet translated in English that I like to read for its special focus on sound. And um, I've tried to imitate the structure of the Skylark Sing and to make a sort of cut up from the uh, last tweet uh, from Twitter uh, of people who have died. There's no translation. Cinque okay. T. Mattino ventoso. Mi sembra pericoloso allenarsi all'aperto. I morti vivono, i morti vivono, i torti stridono. Con dei colori autentici, dei morti in attesa, vivono, vivono. Ora di partenza prevista, sempre. Mia mamma ed io, passato, adios, grazie, fine, liberare, non ho parole ultime. Liberare il passato per riposare, 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 liberare il passato davvero, davvero. Vivremo, vinceremo. Dove il passato appena finito aspetta? Dove il passato appena finito aspetta? Dove il passato appena finito aspetta? Dove sempre? Spettacolo gradito, legno, sono andato, sono finito della prima stesura, solo merda, aspetta. Angelo legna a riposare, angeli o legna a riposare, angeli o legna a riposare, angeli o legna, sono via ora, vinceremo, vinceremo, legna vinceremo. Legna vinceremo, legna vinceremo, legna vinceremo, legna vinceremo, legna. Sto aspettando di fare un angiogramma in vita, una vita, una vita, una vita, una vita, una vita, 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 vita. Assaggiate finalmente le ostriche, finito, vita, 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 più profondamente passato, un fanculo a tutti, passato. forgot to mention uh, that uh, most of the work done uh, lately for Peter Gezi and Laura Liberale and Rosemary Waldrop was not carried out by me or not me alone but by Federica Santini and uh, she is and I think She will also be chairing, uh, chairwomaning, come si dice, chairpersoning the next uh, round table. And uh, that will deal with uh, a, some of the controversial statements that we have been hearing during the last two days concerning research poetry, new experimental poetry, poetry of complexity. We are going to talk about it and perhaps 
although I'm not in uh, the roster of speaking, I'd like to say something at the end myself. Thank you. And our uh, Professor Finotti, the director, would like to say a few words and then we'll have the round Yes, table. no, no, uh, just uh, two words. <clears throat> in order to thank you, because uh, everybody is uh, thanking uh, Casa Zirilli Merimor, uh, uh, the Instituto, of course, but uh, a special thank you to Berardo Paradiso, who is uh, here, and uh, who is right, uh, because uh, we have uh, from our, on one side Agincourt, uh, but also the support uh, to the activity of the Instituto. So thank you so much, Berardo, and thank you very much. We have not forgotten. Yeah, if the speakers can come up, Fabrizio, Marco, e Daniele. Do we have Marco? There. Yes, 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 sir. Thank you. The speakers are settled. Let's get started. We have three speakers here in the house, plus uh, uh, Francesco Mozzoli joining us from Rome on Zoom. So I'm, uh, I'm honored to be introducing this uh, first sec session on research poetry. Uh, a rose, pardon me, a poem by any other name. Um, in 20 plus years of working with Luigi, Beppe, and Gianluca on research poetry, one thing we can agree of that we don't agree. <laughs> and four of us <laughs> cannot quite pinpoint what research poetry is. But I think that's the great part of all it, because that work has allowed us to uh, drawing uh, the many diverse voices that we've heard yesterday, we'll hear today, and uh, we're going to hear tomorrow. In this case, we have a, a quite formidable set of four uh, scholars, poets, uh, publishers, uh, uh, researchers, uh, and I hope friends who discuss research poetry, so we have uh, Fabrizio Bondi from uh, Suor Ursula, wh whose work is a veritable wunderkammer of uh, literary criticism from the 1500s to today, to my knowledge. We have uh, Francesco Muzioli joining us uh, for, uh, on Zoom, uh, a, a seminal scholar of the new avant-garde of research poetry who guided my own work and the work of many years. And then uh, we have um, Marco Giovanale, poet, dissenting voice, <laughs> a scholar critic, uh, and the same could go for uh, Daniele Poletti, a uh, Tuscan like me, a uh, poet, critic, and a uh, subvertor. Uh, <laughs> I don't have... Uh, expectations to find a solution to what research poetry is, but I do have wishes. So what I wish for is uh, disassembling, reverting, and finally subverting. So I hope and wish for much subversion in this poem, in this session and poetry talk. Thank you for being here. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody, obviously to Luigi Ballerini, <laughs> and uh, etc. And uh, uh, the first time uh, with Luigi and Marco and uh, Simone, we started to uh, debate about this question of label, okay? The label to put to the poetry in which we trust, you can say. <laughs> and uh, I was, uh, uh, I noticed that there was a strange switch between uh, two metaphors field uh, because uh, we pass uh, from uh, a, a military metaphor, avant-garde poetry is a military metaphor. The avant-garde soldier is the, the one who goes in the no man's land to, in order to discover new lands. So it fits, but the military echo remains, okay? And then we switch to a, a science metaphor, research, experiment, and then there is this new proposal of complexity. There is something maybe new, but I don't know. And uh, it, okay, I was very, very intrigued by this uh, switch of metaphoric fields because, uh, uh, because uh, maybe the science is the continuation of the war with other means, uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe uh, because the poetry uh, needed to, uh, you know, um, searching for help uh, in other science, the military science, and then the, the sciences, uh, hard sciences, okay? And, but it was a reflection too, okay, too huge, uh, a huge reflection, I, I, I can, and so maybe in the print uh, pheasant, I, in the printed version of pheasant of uh, one, <laughs> 100 and uh, I don't know how, how many pages. And uh, <laughs> I, will, I will write something about this. But uh, uh, today uh, I want to discuss uh, a single phrase uh, sort in the wake of a medieval hermeneutics. In particular, the sentence I will analyze was pronounced by Luigi Ballerini in a very interesting conversation with Daniele Poletti. Uh, uh, we can find it on YouTube uh, and it's a very interesting, uh, um, interesting uh, interview. And the sentence is, I quote, great writers need great readers. A much admirable statement, although I admit I find it a, a little bit mysterious. But after all, all good oracles must be. Everybody agrees, I reckon, that a great writer is ever also a great reader, okay? I'm not sure on the contrary, Tug Borges used to say that any European is in potence or in act a writer. Moreover, according to Giorgio Manganelli, as he writes, in his Discorso dell'Ombre dello Stemma, there's no difference between a reader and a writer, as they are both obsessed, persecuted by the same curse, which is also a blessing, the words. Yet for Manganelli, there's no loftiness in literature, in the rhetorical construction of Manganelli. Uh, quite the contrary, literature is a lie, is a filthy activity, notwithstanding the necessity of having commerce with words in order to be in the world. Now, my first question addressed to Professor Ballerini and obviously to myself and to everybody here is, why must a reader be great? The reason why a writer must be great are apparently comprehensible. And they are indeed, even if we let aside for a moment the old humanist myth of immortality with its panoply of angels and trumpets of fame, and apply these comprehensible reasons to some honest worker of the world striving to survive against the current legion, biblical legion, 
of amateur poets. But the reader, why should he become one super reader, a überleser? <laughs> Uh, Aristotle, for example, was satisfied of a common man as a spectator of his tragedy. Uh, a medium man, not so intelligent, but also not so dumb. Um, but in our times, at least from modernism onward, the poetical offer paradoxical, out, uh, the poetical offer paradoxical outnumbers the demand, and I use uh, here economic terms on purpose with all sorts of conundrums, fascinating but obscure. Common sense should then suggest then be that before conceiving of a great reader, we should be able to figure a good reader. A reader who, uh, who in flickering moments of grace and inspiration, might sense greatness. A reader who would function as the blueprint for the other one, the great. Generally speaking, the act of reading implies two basic things, skills and time. Skills are school care. Yet after primary school, the young student faces the problem of what and above all, why to continue to read. If, the, if on the one hand, the drive to read in teenagers and young adults coheres around the principle of pleasure, the super erotic instances provided by school uh, offers various solutions to the problem, for example, by creating a canon of must reads. But it's obvious, or it's obvious to me at least, that the pedagogy of, uh, of literature has a political background and a political aim. For example, Italy's historical idealistic approach from the 19th century to the day before yesterday aimed at shaping the Italianity of Italians molding methods for teaching literature on a complex nationalistic project. For example, if you, if you read uh, the Storia della Letteratura Italiana of Francesco De Santis, it's a kind of novel with plot twist, with uh, eye uh, peaks uh, and uh, the terrible, uh, you know, falls. No? For example, uh, from Dante to Giambattista Marino, no? it's a kind of, uh, uh, you know, Montagne Russe, in the, uh, and, uh, and then with Leopardi, we, uh, we get up again uh, with, with Leopardi and Manzoni. It's uh, a construction, uh, a kind of uh, narration, uh, storytelling, okay? On the contrary, the Anglo-Saxon, specifically North American method, is based on debate and rhetorical arguments. Those talk might seem quite simplifying, I'm, I'm aware I'm simplifying a lot here. I'm convinced that founding the act of reading and the literature class uh, on arguments and discussion aims at staging a student's future professional battles, therefore preparing him to fit in a liberal or liberalistic or liberalistic society. Uh, should one want to take this consideration at face value, one will need to acknowledge the fact that the crisis of the reader be it common or great, is ingrained in a pedagogical crisis. The great problem is, in fact, the meaning that we give today to the acts of teaching and learning. Uh, as Lyotard, François Lyotard, so vividly pointed out in his La Condition Postmoderne, I am trying to impress you with my French pronunciation, uh, postmodern condition, Teaching institutions and university in the first place do not function as truth makers anymore. And despite being a researcher and a teacher myself, I can't help but doubting that state pedagogy would effectively contribute in forming a freer and a self-aware individual as a more or less great right reader. Moreover, and despite my involvement in experiments like the one we have seen yesterday, more or less, uh, with which we aim at reaching McLuhan, the famous McLuhan classes without walls, uh, my faith in the new technology is in absolute nor dogmatic. Nonetheless, after more than 60 years from McLuhan's famous article, we are still in an experimental phase, the outcomes of which are still unscrutable. 
Maybe Foucault, Les Soucis de Soi, The Care of the Self, can be help here. In fact, the only care of ourselves, which the universal ideology demands to us today, is the care of the body. But we know what used to be the meaning of self-care, for example, for Seneca, an accurate exploration of our, our own interiority, which also literature can lead, to us, uh, can lead us to. That is, for me, the souci de soi we need today, if only to avoid both the innumerable dangers of the psychoanalysis, the formed progeny, and the sirens of the new age. But this concept, but uh, one thing must be very clear, in my opinion, this concept needs to be envisioned into a political framework. Okay? To clarify this last statement, allow me to share a personal memory. I remember my father's small but rich personal library, through which I was fortunate enough to discover Freud, Kafka, Montale, Ungaretti, but also Karl Marx, Marcuse, and Mao Zedong, which my father despised with all his art. He wasn't a militant in the movement of 68, but he would have considered a great error as a citizen to ignore what was happening around him. Now, to tackle the question of time, everybody, scholars, writers, experience the difficulty to go in through some monument of complexity like Ezra Pound Cantos, for example, or Proust, La Recherche, Joyce, Ulysses, and so on and so forth. These readings took time, quality time, as we used to say, let alone skills which we had to fabricate step by step during the reading journey. The reward has been immense, obviously, as any reader of those books knows very well. Now, if you ask a non-professional reader, for example, a friend, a non-scholar non friend, uh, why don't you read, for example, uh, Ulysses or uh, Pound, Cantos, and uh, it's beautiful, uh, you discover a lot of things, and etc., etc. And the usual answer is, uh, ah, I'd like to read it. Uh, I'd like to read it, but I have no time. I have no time. And, uh, the, and at that point, your friend generally starts with a huge enumeration of time-wasting elements, jobs, sons, old parents, pets, other interests, and so forth. I don't think this standard answer is totally hypocritical. We live in an economic system that is more or less based on stealing of personal time. We are forced to become entrepreneur of ourselves, so our time is colonized, colonized even when it's officially free. On top of all this, uh, the narcissistic confessional circus of the social media and their dictaten pulverize the time for the souci de soi, not to mention the loss of concentration which everybody also, as scholars, experience every day. There are bad times to conceiving the reading as an art. Mark Fisher, and this is the third quotation of <laughs> Mark Fisher, but evidently is necessary, claims uh, in one of his books that the only ones which have the possibility to really read are the inmates. A terrible statement. We need to overrule this condition, but how? I think that to find an answer, or at least try, or at least to put the problem on the table, okay? Uh, we need to go back to the very sources of poetical modernism. In a beautiful series of lessons about Rimbaud, Michel Boutor talks about the two famous Lettres du Voyant, Letters of the Visionary. Boutor underlines how Rimbaud refused for himself the so-called ivory tower. He says that we all have duties towards society, and he has the intention to become a worker, but not under the Thiers regime, which repressed in blood the Paris Commune. Working means, according to Rimbaud, be a poet, but what kind of poet? A poet whose poetry has the power to modify society, a poet active, actively and who's po uh, and actually involved in the transformation of the society herself. Rambeau tried to change the language of poetry by transforming the language himself, 
This is the meaning according to Butor of the famous uh, uh, sonnet uh, La Couleur de Voyelle. Okay? Uh, the poet must be able to invent new language in order to speak to all men, but also with gods, animals, all natural beings. I was, I remember the beautiful, uh, the beautiful speech of uh, Gianluca and, uh, uh, and uh, the, the, the Brazilian school. And uh, it's incredible uh, that Rimbaud, uh, okay, uh, was talking about these things. And this revolution of language was strictly intertwined with what Gilles Deleuze called the revolutionary becoming, devenir revolutionnaire, in which society was involved at the time of the Commune of Paris. This is a very controversial word, revolution. Many years ago, the Enaudi Publishing House entitled a collection, a collection of Walter Benjamin's essay, Av uh, Avanguardia Revolutione, av Avanguard and Revolution, how to, to interpret this end. Uh, I, was, I always read it as a significant coordination. Any avant-garde is impossible without the idea of a possible revolution. Yet every avant-garde calls us to revolution, at least because they imply a faith in a new man and for consequentially in a new use, user of art, our great reader. But alas, we don't trust the possibility of a new man as we don't have faith no more in revolution. To quote Mark Fisher again, we are living in time in which it's easier to trust in the end of the world than in the end of capitalism. Poetry, our poetry, the complex and free poetry which we like, can be first of all an antidote to the melancholia engendered by ideology and praxis of late capitalism. Every form of true literature, in fact, is a form of resistance, smoldering the seeds of a people to come, our only hope is that they leave us experimenting in our little corner, as Deleuze used to say. He also said that yes, revolution fail, as everybody knows, but this won't prevent people to be caught in new devenir revolutionnaire. To conclude, I'm convinced that the path of a great reader starts from pleasure and ends in desire a desire of being a different self in a different world. Thank you. Grazie Fabrizio, Professor Muzzioli, se ci sente, ci siamo. Può sentirci? So, Francesco? Wait. Sì, il microfono è aperto. Ecco. Perfetto. Perfetto, prego. Uh, it's my turn. Thank you. And thanks uh, to my translator, uh, Nick Benson. Um, I wait uh, eh, the translation. Thank you. Negli ultimi tempi si sono verificate in Italia, nel campo della poesia, alcune iniziative che avviate separatamente una dall'altra sembrano possedere punti di convergenza. Carmine Lubrano ha riunito alcuni rappresentanti della terza ondata in un fascicolo di Terra del Fuoco intitolato All'avanguardia permanente e vari testi di quegli autori stanno per essere pubblicati dall'editore D'Ambrosio. Marco Giovenale ha aperto un dibattito sulla scrittura di ricerca a partire da un saggio sul Verri e poi con vari interventi raccolti nel suo sito slowforward.net, 
e soprattutto con un incontro molto affollato a Roma seguito da ulteriori contributi. A sua volta Daniele Poletti prepara un'antologia che contiene anche autori piuttosto giovani sotto il titolo Continuo repertorio di scrittura complessa. Niente di che, non basta ancora a fare notizia. Tuttavia colpisce la trasversalità intergenerazionale di questi progetti, gli anziani, i maturi, gli emergenti. E ancora di più colpisce che mentre la poesia sembrava ormai fatta di insorgenze individuali e dei relativi narcisismi, sia sorta un'esigenza di raccordo collettivo, una inaspettata insiemità. Sarà stato a causa della fine dell'isolamento per la pandemia, ma si nota una strana voglia di vedersi e di discutere insieme. Qualcuno potrebbe malignamente insinuare che si tratta solo di una richiesta di attenzione da parte di autori che si sentono trascurati e non valutati, confusi nella massa. Ma se così fosse, le rimostranze sarebbero prettamente individuali. Scegliere la discussione è comunque un indice di consapevolezza più ampia. Evidentemente gli intervenuti non intendono giustificarsi con l'ispirazione che soffia dove vuole lei, ma sentono il bisogno di trovare motivazioni condivise e ragionate. Ora, per discutere è necessario un terreno d'intesa ed è necessario un linguaggio. La poetica singola, anche se già un primo passo, finirebbe per non relazionarsi. Occorre il richiamo in servizio della teoria, un discorso in Italia sempre tenuto ai margini, come se rovinasse con i suoi intellettualismi la purezza della poesia. Vorrei sottolineare per l'appunto i termini teorici messi al centro in queste iniziative, perché sono assai interessanti. Sull'avanguardia permanente non mi dilungo qui, ho dato poco tempo fa a Terra del Fuoco un saggio in proposito. È uno spunto paradossale, tendente a liberare la nozione di avanguardia dal determinismo delle fasi storiche e con ciò dagli organigrammi e dalle patenti dei movimenti ufficiali. L'avanguardia continua dopo tutte le sue fini, la sua eredità è sempre disponibile, proprio perché è l'imperativo a fare diversamente e sta nelle scelte di ciascuno di noi. Qualcosa di più dirò dei termini relativamente nuovi di ricerca e complessità. Ricerca. Questo termine possiede un'evidente sfumatura scientifica che lo ricollega alla stagione dello sperimentalismo e fa da utile contrappeso a un lirismo esclusivamente sentimentale. Aggiungere alla poesia la ricerca significa marcare un forte carattere distintivo, necessario a combattere la confusione in una vaga nozione di poesia con la maiuscola che comprende cose diversissime, dalle pretese visionarie alle ingenuità diaristiche. Tante cose tranne l'alternativa. Qui entra in campo anche la necessità di un calibrato esercizio critico. Infatti, per separare una scrittura di ricerca da una non di ricerca, occorre seguire alcune procedure, stabilire alcuni criteri, riferirsi dialetticamente a un metodo. Ecco un punto su cui il dibattito potrebbe svilupparsi. Quale critica per quale ricerca? Venendo alla complessità, questo termine in primo luogo indica una distanza tra significato e senso, quindi fa da contrappeso alla comunicazione semplificata, fondata sull'immediatezza, anche per una ragione commerciale, la letteratura ormai ridotta a instant text. Possiamo subito immaginare le obiezioni, quelle dell'autore che vuole esprimersi e condividere la propria interiorità, per cui non si giova di troppi giri di parole, e quelle del pubblico che vuole ottenere il premio di un buon contenuto dal tempo impiegato per capire leggendo. Nel quadro di una letteratura intesa come intrattenimento legato al tempo libero, queste obiezioni sono plausibili. La lettura non sopporta di essere anch'essa un lavoro. 
Tuttavia non c'è bisogno di troppa filosofia o psicoanalisi per accorgersi della fallacia espressiva. Il linguaggio con cui l'autore pensa di esprimere se stesso è tanto più se è un linguaggio semplificato, è un prodotto sociale. Le parole sono già state dette, grondano di senso comune. L'unica possibilità di renderle soggettive è di rielaborarle e radicalmente. Si può dire allora che l'unica autenticità sta nella lotta con le parole, o meglio, nell'introdursi di un discorso individuale mirato dentro un conflitto, dentro un campo di forza eterogeneo, dove è inevitabile che nasca la complessità. Ritengo necessario porre la differenza tra trasmissione e comunicazione. La trasmissione è il già noto, ciò che viene recepito rapidamente sulla scorta dell'abitudine. La comunicazione è mettere qualcosa in comune, un ordigno verbale problematico sia per chi lo ha fatto che per chi lo riceve. La trasmissione garantisce l'appropriazione e così rafforza la proprietà privata del linguaggio, ovvero la solidità dell'identità. La comunicazione invece avvia il percorso di una ricerca, la ricerca di una chiave interpretativa, di un codice linguistico, eccetera. Ricerca e apertura. Sarebbe meglio non dirne di più per non pregiudicarne gli esiti. E so bene che la teoria, con le sue parole d'ordine, in passato è stata sentita dagli autori come invadente e troppo imperativa. Per giunta, le specificazioni andrebbero soprattutto lasciate agli autori più giovani. Adesso tocca a loro fare movimento. E però la formula non può rimanere vuota, pena la sua dissoluzione. Infatti, a chi si negherebbe una ricerca se rimanesse nel vago della buona volontà? E poi, la poesia di ricerca non è altro che la poesia fatta bene? Allora saremmo ancora nell'ambito di un'estetica che cerca di stabilire una sticella alta per escludere la zavorra del dilettantismo. Oppure, invece, è un modo per dire facciamo altro. A me pare che ricerca suggerisca il superamento dei limiti. E allora plurilinguismo, superamento del linguaggio proprio, prosaicità, superamento dei generi, incongruità semantica, superamento dell'isotopia, interferenza e interruzione, superamento dell'unità. Per non essere riassorbiti nella confusione occorre un cambio di campo. Se continuiamo a pensare alla poesia in termini di reazione individuale, fatto privato, empatia, vibrazioni impalpabili, indescrivibili altrimenti, comunque rapporto intuitivo con la parola, non potremo sfuggire all'abbraccio con tutta quella produzione che vi si riferisce in modo sommario e senza discernimento. Si riapre allora la questione beniaminiana della tendenza, non solo della qualità. Personalmente uso questo motto, fare di ogni estetica una semiotica, per poi valutare su quel terreno la strategia e il posizionamento ideologico. Infine, a proposito dell'impegno, sono sempre meno propenso alla supplenza della politica. Ci sono tempi bui in Italia, in Europa, nel mondo. Tuttavia la battaglia politica va, va portata avanti con l'urgenza necessaria in quanto cittadini, nelle associazioni e nelle manifestazioni a ciò preposte. La responsabilità della scrittura creativa non si può esaurire in un intervento al servizio della cronaca. Lo diceva già Vittorini nella vecchia diatriba su Politecnico e vale ancora. L'impegno ci deve essere, ma a mio parere deve essere un impegno sul fondo, disinvestire, distogliere se mai possibile, operare scorporazioni invece che incorporazioni e disattrattori invece di attrattori, la diversione di cui parlava Walter Benjamin. Non voglio ipotecare nessun esito, chiedo solo al dibattito di rispondere a un'esigenza di radicalità, Sta di fatto che, al punto di degrado in cui siamo arrivati, comunque lo si voglia mettere, la ricerca è un compito molto difficile e complesso. Ma questi, ricerca e complessità, 
sono per me i termini giusti della questione da porre. Thank you very much. Procediamo con Marco Giovanale e Daniele Coletti, poi le un intervento di Luigi e le domande le faremo insieme dopo. Se, se resta con noi ci fa un immenso piacere. Thanks to you all and a uh, special thank to the translator of, uh, of my text. This is Nicholas Benson, and I for, forgot, and I apologize for this, to thank my, the translator of the text that I read yesterday, which is Joshua Adams. And of course, uh, those translations have, have been conducted in, again with the Luigi Ballerini and Beppe Cavatorca. My, uh, the title of the text I'm, I'm just about to read is An Effects Machine some spare parts for descriptions and theories of contemporary writing, I, 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 ought, I should add, in Italy. Um, if a text is written by a poet, it's customary to say uh, that it is a piece of writing en poet. But like Artaud, Antonin Artaud, with God's judgment, perhaps the time has come, even in Italy in the 21st century, to begin questioning the legitimacy of attempts to do away with the judgment of poetry with canonical poetry, and perhaps even with poetry itself, at least if that self insists on the capital P, or employs a false lowercase. This is not to say that resisting doing away with it implies an evangelizing movement. It is always subjective, of course, but poetic expression is a part of a very crowded, and maybe even dangerously, international network of subjectivities. So this will not be a piece of writing on poet, but at the same time I must also add that I am not a critic of the same. So we're speaking now. <laughs> I myself don't know. And I, and I think that who is speaking is the text in itself, written by someone who has just dealt with some of the um, issues uh, we are just confronting in this, these days. Um, each machine, I, I, remember, I, I recall the, the title, an FX machine, some spare parts for descriptions in theory and theories of contemporary writing in Italy. Each machine, meaning machine in an eco-compatible and human sense, I'm not contrasting the machine made with the organic, produces a series of, et of effects which obviously act on it in return. So what does this essay's title mean, an effects machine? An effects machine is, and uh, I here have five points, First, contemporary criticism, and criticisms of contemporary writing and precise, explicit, explicitly phenomenological examples, or I should say what I'd like a, criti a criticism could do with some weird texts. Two, a machine that would like to have an effect, call me, but not necessarily so, on the controversies, factions and fractions which have always manifested themselves. Three, a machine made up of different pieces that may be thought of as premises of analysis and as the beginning of refinement of the same to then generate other effects of critical reading or research texts or, to quote uh, Luigi Ballerini, radical poetry texts by the authors themselves or by authors more linked to some specific tradition. For an effect machine is, of course, text, or rather writing, not only contemporary. First of all, language itself, in general, without connotation, not adjectival, fragmented into sets, currents. Its effects can be affective or logical, mathematical, or of another nature, such as reasoning, deceptive, sapiential, exhortative, ornamental, time-wasting, up-creating, and so on. On the net, one hears uh, with startling frequency the uh, Radical research poetry accused of an affection, poverty of emotion. Okay, experimental writing may be ineffective, perhaps, but they cannot be, and no article of language can be ineffective. So do, uh, they do have effects. They cannot fail to have effects. Five, effects machine is the relapse into structures, plastic or rigid, of texts and criticism. The structures can be found online, for example, the lyric, 
uh, as mapped in an in initiative of Pordenone and Legge or in uh, um, magazines, uh, paper magazines like Nuovi Argumenti or the Mag Poesia published by Feltrinelli and Crocetti. Or mm, in, for the experimental area, uh, you can uh, uh, refer to x.it, which exists both as a hard copy and an online site. Um, or, or in Glorious Mags and Publishing House Il Verri, for example, uh, which was created by Luciano Anceschi in 1956. Or anthologies like the one by Vincenzo Stuni, Poeti degli Anni Zero, or other more recent and remote uh, initiatives and anthologies like Parola Plurale, which was published in 2005 by um, Luca Sossella. Of, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, we have here in this, in this room two of the editors of it, uh, uh, Cecilia Bellominciacchi and Andrea Cortellesi. Or all the way back to the anthologies of the 80s and 70s. Or it can even be born of meetings that are then documented with critical materials as a PDF on the net. For example, Prove di Ascolto, edited by Fabio Teti and Simona Menicocci. In this case, uh, specifically, the case of Provedia Scolto, there are no typological distinctions. Um, Provedia Scolto was uh, explicitly derived from a meeting and plus a volume of critical texts and poems published by Metauro in 1999-2000 under the title Acusma, that which is heard, edited by the great poet, seminal poet in Italy, Giuliano Mesa, 1957-2011. I also remind uh, the uh, issue, the special issue of, uh, of the magazine Auf Gabe, uh, published by Litmus Press, uh, say, uh, 12 years ago, more or less, uh, edited by Jennifer Scapettone. Now uh, it, is a, it is a PDF freely downloadable online. Let's come to the spare parts. If one wanted to change some critical presumptions, not necessarily categories or poetry, or poetics, or even broader segments of what is thinkable as literary, at least in Italy, now, the way would be open to do some things. One advances a few steps on unsteady planks which may not necessarily hold up, but which some, including this writer, have set up between one page and another, one kind of research and another. And I just want to uh, give a series of, of, of uh, lines about this. First line, the possibility of attenuating or seeing disappear behind horizons of another nature still to be studied, the attribution of a value trait to the fundamental semantic and rhythm quali rhythmic qualities of the text, or even indifference to these qualities. The poems of Michele Zaffarano has been mentioned uh, a few uh, hours ago by uh, Cecilia Bello, or can be cited as an example or a part of Gerardo Bortolotti's prose. Both those, uh, these authors are born in the, in the 70s. Um, or we can say, unlike, why, uh, unlike works by authors who were central in radical poetry in Italy, especially in the second half of the, ninth, in the, of the 20th century, from Emilio Villa to Gianni Totti, from Eduardo Cacciatore to the Sanguinetti of Laborintus, um, some of the poets born in the late 60s and the first half of the 70s have been and still are working on texts which do not deal with the volcanic idea of language expressed by Emilio Villa or the first Sanguinetti. So something different has happened in the years of the, uh, in, the in the last years of the, of the of the past century and the first two decades of this century. Uh, it is a smart piece of uh, um, Laborintus, no, this is another thing. As a consequence of all that has been mentioned here, the invariable temporal measure of the writing is diminished or disappears. First of all, I'd point the case of Retro by Corrado Costa, poet born in 1929 and he died in 1991. An audio track about eight minutes in length, um, which offers the following information. Quote, recorded in Parma and Brescia in 1981 and published posthumously in the magazine Beobab, Phonetic Information of Poetry, edited by Adriano Spatola, end quote. What is uh, exactly retro? It is a smart, a smart piece of uh, prose, say prose, uh, poetry, obsessively repeating retro, retro, you are on the uh, wrong 
side of the tape, please stop, change, change, change side, reverse the cassette, you dumb, why don't you change uh, the side, this is the retro, you are wrong, you are, you are making it wrong, not listen to me, this is the retro, 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 and so on, for eight minutes, for the length of eight minutes. And, and, and what exactly prevents us from thinking of the recorded piece as shorter, segmentable, even, re, even reworkable? It can be cut, its durability, its texture, the material it includes, everything can be shortened, lengthened, varied. There are no rigid strictures to do uh, with its integrity that must be subjected to a stylistic, stylistic analysis. One can begin to deviate from stylistic analysis in the old sense. And what, what is at stake here is not the fact that this peculiar text is made this way, but the idea of the text it implies, the kind of feeling it causes in the reader, the idea that the text can be varied and indefinitely varied. In terms of graphic evasion, as well as temporal, perhaps the, rec the recent electronic poems by Fabrizio Venerandi, offer, born in 1970, offer, offer us uh, another, another uh, good example of uh, what can be uh, uh, a text of great complexity and, uh, and, uh, and, and beauty. Um, it's impossible to, to visualize it here, and uh, it's my fault because I didn't prepare myself, so I, I couldn't have here the, 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 the EPUB. But the, the, the peculiar kind of uh, the electronic poetry made by Fabrizio Venerandi made the, makes the, uh, the page something con um, uh, continuously changing. Uh, and, it's a, and it's a text that has a, a continuous interaction with the reader. So the reader doesn't have a, a, a single text on the page. The page is an electronic page, so it, it, it's a, something flickering uh, under his eyes. And uh, maybe I would cite also my gifts from years and years ago. Uh, the, the first I, I made was, uh, the, the, they were in, in, uh, made in 2014, but that kind of, uh, of, uh, of experiments were rigid. So nothing to do with the uh, uh, plastic and, and lively uh, works by Fabrizio Venerandi. This aversion, or rather indifference to rhythms, and uh, I have to say, in, in invariable texts, can gather in masses, such as the regular, irregular appearance of segments or blocks, rhythmic neither for the eye nor for the ear of different lengths, tissues and of, rep of uh, repetitions, intentional paralogisms or sophisms, obsessive uh, phrasal returns, as in the prose pieces of Christophe Tarkos, are absolutely clear as other examples. Christophe Tarkos was born in 1963, died in 2004, or in uh, André Anglès' Prati, published firstly, first in, uh, by La Camera Verde in 2007, and then uh, included in Prosa in Prosa, which is a in prose in prose, which is a, a, a not an anthology, but I call it a collective book published in the collection, in a series uh, curated by Andrea Cortellesa for the uh, publishing house uh, Le Lettere in 2009, as I said. Um, another point, another line, the opposite of, of these spare parts. I am just listing the spare parts. Uh, the opposite of our ornate, rhetorically enhanced, perhaps hyper-cultured discourse with broad ramifications in the connotative can be read in the flat, dry, and literally, literal denotative and in the very idea of désaffoublement, as Jean-Marie Jean Glaise would say, or of integral nudity, or literalité, stripped, completely stripped of complications and embellishments without the moves of the reader, the barker, the fine speaker, whether oral or moved to the page, assonance, rhyming, rhythmic speech, wordplay, etc. Another line, bubbling, losing coherence within the text, as in the works of Luc Benazé, in the lalation of Emilio Villa, and back to the intentionally incomprehensible litanies of Antonin and Artaud, and beware, it is not a child's language something like Zanzotto's Patel, maybe. Nor is it plotted with, with the semantic references. It is not his intention, the intention of Luc Benazé or, or other um, writers like him, 
uh, it is not his intention to reconstruct a healthy text of which stammering would be corruption. It is really originally, inherently crushed. And let me open now a parenthesis and say that uh, what I just said, especially in points three and five, the last one that I read, uh, is not in contradiction with my deep interest in what we yesterday heard in the brilliant talk about pen sound and the extraordinary tools pen sound offers to the critics, the listeners, and the readers. I want to point out that I here am specifically focusing on a feeling of variability which is implied in being part of a digitally reshaped world which was born decades ago. Another line. The uncertain irony found by Vincenzo Stuni, born in 1970, he is a critic and a poet as well, and texts by Michele Zaffarano, uh, for example, in a text that's called uh, Cinque Testi, and it, it was published in 2014. Uh, th this irony, this uncertain irony, is equal to that found by Luigi Magno, um, uh, a critic who deals with the uh, French poetry, and the texts of uh, Nathalie Cantin, who was born in uh, 1964. So this kind of irony just uh, deals with the text with, a, with, a, with an impressive uh, uncertainty about its own status. We don't know reading the text if, if, our, if we are just reading something that is actually ironic, ironic or not. Um, so we can read that, that text uh, uh, exactly in, in its precise, precise meaning, or maybe just suspect that there's an, an ironic uh, in, in intention under it. Another line, the idea of installation. The idea of an installation uh, and not a f performative text. An installation is not necessarily an opposite, but certainly as another possible praxis with respect to performance. For example, I make just uh, three examples. For example, Veil by Charles Bernstein, written in 1976, which is a curtain of text. You can't actually read it. It's an installation. Uh, or La Drame de la Vie by Valère Novarina, published in 1984. They're wall of texts. Or I remember the curtains of wall of sounds of the incredible uh, musician John Coltrane. Um, Another, another author I just remember is Peter Gannick, who re recently died, and uh, who published uh, enormous blocks of texts that were just like, uh, like statues, and it was not possible to read them in a linear way. Again, another line. The maintenance of prose and works of prose completely and firmly unable to be summarized and recast into a novel. Not to say that the novel is our enemy, but to say that uh, such a predator can be put away from the, from the path uh, just uh, we are uh, on. Short prose as an internal detonator within a poetic flow. I'm thinking in particular of the prose pieces of authors you don't know, but I just mentioned them, and I hope that in the proceedings of this of this uh, uh, days uh, we will. I ha I'll have the opportunity to just quote some of the texts, and the names are the, those of Elisa Davoglio, Giulio Marzaioli, Manuel Micaletto, Mariangela Guatteri, Fabio Teti. Fabio Teti published the Spazio di Destot with uh, uh, Diaforia, which is a publishing house uh, run by uh, Daniele Poletti. Here we have an absolute disconnection from the syntax of narrative, especially if it is all-encompassing. In the case of Tati, disappearance of causality or generally uh, of hypothetic syntax. Another line. Suspension of the tragic and emergence of parody without mechanisms crystallizing into style or norm again, as in Carmelo Bene, for example. Again, suspicion cast until onto logos. This is nothing, th nothing new, of course, but repetita juvent. <laughs> Apposite quotation from Carmelo Bene, Sono apparso alla Madonna. In cinema, I, s quote, in cinema, I certainly faced the use of the image in ways I always refused and found unbearable, a servile, decadent cinema, a cinema of the literary provinces, where progress depends on the reliability of the story of logos, etc., etc. 
again. Orality is in plain some new writing and not as a substitute of or origin or point of antagonism toward the written, as some write or say from time to time, whether or not with polemical intent. So, if you want, we may say that uh, a possible modus of speech, metamorphosis, is on the field and at stake, marked. It is, in the end, the great discovery of Céline, maybe, but in some respects also of Carmelo Bene. In other words, the game and what's at stake is still and always the same, not the said. It is the speaking, not the reporting, the clear appearance, the presence of the ego in saying, uh, the saying and the parallel feeling as listeners uh, as to be confronted with something that may change. So, and the emergence of some movement of speaking from time, from history, from chronos, which in, if anything, flashes only to immediately vanish, to slip away into itself, like a yawn. At work in this exhaustion of meaning through the wearing down of meaning, by massive molecular infection and, per, and perhaps the denotative saturation of the signifier. An example is in the work of another author, more or less my age. See his volume, Aria Communione, published by Icona Libre in 2014. Here we find what was outlined at the book, parody, suspension of the tragic, the signified, multiplied, to wear down the signifier, and exhaust the sense, not fully or orality, therefore not full assertive song, if anything, detached from itself, as has been said already, and from the risk of spectacle, of making a show. Listen to Corticelli once, if you find something by him online, and you will realize this. The new writing completely avoids the dimension of paranetic, moralizing, assertive posture and posture. On the contrary, the sayings of the fini dicitori, the critic clowns of assertive poetry, are the sayings of the desert feathers. Desert is still there, but the feathers are not. Pas d'orphanage, of course. There never have been fathers, so nothing is reported or said. If anything, there is saying that has stopped summoning us to a scene. Therefore, there is no show, and consequently, every possibility falls short of making a show rhetoric, a concertino arising from pain, so to speak. The pain that precedes speech, for the purpose of saying something beautiful and memorable. Just as for Carmelo Bene, the theater is without spectacle, so writing is without the spectacle of the writer creating the writer, the scribe who dictates jurisprudence, or rather applies its laws. He writes in public, he holds the pen follows in public, the microphone of the poet, and in short offers the pop spectacle of the world's orality, new realist, or rather of an oratory and oracularity of a certain type that says prayers, counts the rosary, very possibly melancholy, social, sociopathic, where, whether euphoric or dysphoric. If there were more time, I would approach the relationship between announcing enunciation and to being spoken, spoken, a reference to the virtues practice that I have elsewhere referred to as loose writing, as mimesis or quasi-mimesis of the regular effects of anacolothon, anacolothon, idiom, family lexicon, implication, accidental slippage, error, all of which normally occur and recur in our conversing, our mistelling, ill-seeing, ill-saying. Thank you. Um, sì. Good evening. Uh, so sorry, uh, but uh, many ritual thanks, uh, uh, but not less important uh, to Luigi Ballerini, uh, Casa Italiana, and uh, Istituto Italiano di Cultura. Thanks for hearing. And thanks to all the kindly staff and uh, to Sandro De Tomasis uh, for the translation. I'll, sp I'll speak in Italian. Uh, in my speech, I will try um, to trace uh, some general lines of that I call uh, complexity of writing. Uh, the text has two alternative and connected titles. Um, they are 
eh, rompere gli steccati e alzare le barricate, la scrittura complessa come superamento e resistenza, scrittura complessa tra informe e parola continua. Affrontare il concetto di scrittura complessa non significa parlare immediatamente di una collocazione normativa eh, che non riuscirebbe a prescindere dalla mia diatriba fra fazioni opposte o peggio della prospettica affermazione di un potere, ma neppure significa abbandonarsi a un relativismo dialettico che di questi tempi risulterebbe eh, a mio avviso controproducente in ragione dell'emergenza sui linguaggi e sulla loro ricezione. È necessario invece a mio avviso partire dal contesto in cui la scrittura pro prolifera e si diffonde, superando la sterilità di un atteggiamento specificamente oppositivo, vedi lirico versus sperimentale, ricerca versus mainstream, eccetera, in favore di una visione più ampia che renda l'approccio complesso all'arte e alle scritture come una necessità intellettuale e sociale svincolata dai posizionamenti, in quanto atto politico con naturale alla formazione di individui liberi. L'idea di scrittura complessa viene inaugurata per la prima volta, in modo quasi indolente dal sottoscritto, eh, nel 2014. Eh, non si tratta di una categoria critica, eh, di una corrente costituita e individuabile o di un manifesto, seppure credo che eh, la situazione delle lettere, almeno in Italia, eh, richiederebbe un manifesto. Piuttosto si tratta di un osservatorio su quelle scritture che risultano irriducibili a precise categorie di comodo. Proprio per questi motivi non è possibile, né auspicabile forse, dare una definizione standard di scrittura complessa. Il concetto si professa in uh, continua, inesausta evoluzione, secondo ciò che François Julien definirebbe perpetuo decoincidere. Del resto sarebbe già una contraddizione in termini semplificare con una definizione ciò che si presenta come irriducibile per natura. Anzi, credo che una scrittura complessa, neocomplessa o della complessità in realtà non esista come identificazione netta e indiscutibile. Al contrario, ad esempio eh, della scrittura sperimentale degli anni 60 e 70 del Novecento, cui, cui si lega comunque ombelicalmente almeno nei presupposti di opposizione all'ordine costituito e come filosofia estetica volta alla progressione delle arti e dell'individuo. Non esiste dunque una scrittura complessa che si dà pro programmaticamente come modus operandi in un ambiente a statuto categoriale. Esistono delle scritture che possono essere ravvisate come complesse attraverso una lente che rilevi, in primis, una indisponibilità all'immediatezza del consumo attraverso un biologico differimento di senso e di segno e che si pone dunque come operazione politica di riappropriazione, riappropriazione della funzione differenziale dell'arte e della scrittura. Il paradigma della complessità inoltre non fa distinzione tra i diversi tipi di scrittura, ehm, un po' come per quanto riguarda l'intermedialità di Dick Higgins. Ehm, la partenza più o meno è, è da lì. Prosa, poesia, teatro, concetto, performance stanno sullo stesso piano di attenzione, come allo stesso tempo pur rifer eh, riferendosi eminentemente alla contemporaneità, il concetto di complessità non prescinde da una visione diacronica della complessità in scrittura, tenendo in debita considerazione le grandi sperimentazioni di un passato anche molto remoto, da Dante a Burchiello, passando per Rabelais, Colengo, Leporeo, Garzoni, eccetera, eccetera. Ora eh, farò un breve, mh, una breve prosecuzione metodologica, diciamo così. Oggi ci troviamo in una condizione assai anomala in cui l'epistemologia e la filosofia della scienza hanno progredito verso la riconsiderazione dell'individuo come condividuo. Nel millennio della biologia, il nostro, si sta affermando una nuova idea di individuo che diventa, per così dire, un sottoinsieme del superorganismo denominato olobionte, formato dal nostro corpo e dalla comunità di microorganismi che ci abitano, il microbiota tale da mettere in discussione la certezza di un sé individuale singolo e specifico per affermare il concetto di condividualità, appunto. 
e ancora oltre non, non si possono ignorare certo le filosofie antispeciste, le culture transgender che declassano in termini orizzontali battagliani la visione homo-antropocentrica antropocentrica del mondo. È perciò evidente uno spostamento radicale del punto di osservazione verso l'alterità, ma è altrettanto evidente che a livello politico, negli ultimi trent'anni, c'è stato un netto posizionamento della bilancia verso le destre più estreme, per richiamare un po' quello che diceva anche Francesco Muzzioli. Alla luce di queste scarne considerazioni appare innegabile una frattura paradossale tra il contegno sociale e la scoperta scientifica. Non potendo qui fare un'approfondita disamina sociologica, però mi pare sufficiente affermare che la formazione intellettuale e culturale dell'individuo ha subito, almeno dagli anni 90 in poi, in Italia, una regressione, quella che definirei un vero e proprio regressus ad uterum, dove il desiderio è completamente sostituito dalla disponibilità. O per dirla con il filosofo Mario Pergnola, la tonalità di base della cultura della performance non è orientata verso il raggiungimento del piacere, ma verso il mantenimento dell'eccitazione. Scomparso eh, l'edonismo tipico degli anni Ottanta, ultima propagine di un desiderio strutturato, siamo oggi in una condizione di dipendenza, addiction, diffusa, in una catena ininterrotta di offerta saturante che priva l'individuo della possibilità di riflessione e di scelta. Questo stato di cose instaura una trasmutazione dei valori linguistici tale che l'inconcludenza, la ritrattazione e la confusione da fattori di debolezza si trasformano in prove di forza e vanno, sostituite, vanno a sostituire l'educazione e l'istruzione con l'edutainment, la politica e l'informazione con l'infotainment, l'arte e la cultura con l'entertainment. Quello che viene definito, ancora con Perniola, Complesso, nel, nel suo complesso democratainment e che ha come diretta conseguenza un processo di sfrenata e eufemizzazione del linguaggio vale a dire uno spostamento che dissimula un disimpegno disinnescando il significato in favore di un, de, di, di un senso forse più articolato ma alimentando, alimentato scusate, da una presunta e apparente morale dei diritti e de, dei doveri il risultato è dunque l'appiattimento delle differenze e l'orizzontalizzazione e impoverimento dell'esperienza, nonché l'instaurazione di una neolingua fatta di perifrasi, acronimi e sigle, che appare a tutti gli effetti un'imposizione di buon governo. Andando a ritroso, si può ipotizzare che questo stato di cose eh, provenga dall'apparizione dell'uomo medio e della società di massa che simbolicamente si fa risalire all'avvento della scienza statistica nel XIX secolo, secolo con Adolf Ketelet. L'uomo accetta progressivamente di essere computato, sondato, manipolato, trasformandosi in tipo più che in individuo e divenendo per se stesso un'astrazione con una impressionante accelerazione del fenomeno nell'era tecnologica avanzata, la nostra. L'essere sottoposti uniformemente agli stessi modi di produzione, esposti agli stessi manufatti, attirati dagli stessi marchi, è un metodo efficace per l'uniformazione del pensiero. La teoria del consumo tende a creare un habitat autoriferito, un hortus conclusus, che produce la serializzazione dei comportamenti, sfavorendo le reazioni individuali, la riflessione personale, instaurando quello che Marcuse chiamava il linguaggio dell'amministrazione totale. In questo tipo di linguaggio la tensione tra apparenza e realtà, fatto e fattore, sostanza e attributo tende a scomparire, promuovendo l'identificazione immediata della ragione col fatto, della verità con la verità stabilita, dell'essenza con l'esistenza, della cosa con l'uso. Gli elementi di autonomia, di scoperta, di dimostrazione critica recedono dinanzi alla designazione, all'asserzione, asser all all'imitazione. La riduzione di ogni cosa a fatto commerciale finisce per unire sfere di vita un tempo antagonistiche e l'unione si esprime nella fluente congiunzione linguistica di parti del discorso in conflitto tra di loro. Dunque l'universo di discorso che caratterizza lo stile commerciale e politico in cui gli opposti sono conciliati è uno dei modi più efficaci per rendere il linguaggio e la comunicazione immuni all'espressione della protesta e del rifiuto. 
in questo contesto dove vigono lo standard e la modellizzazione dei fenomeni, l'efficienza ha precedenza assoluta rispetto alla funzione. La democrazia repressiva, per parafrasare Marcuse, dispensa risposte immediate per un'immediata comprensione come strumento per l'imbonimento amniotico e il controllo delle masse, intese come carne da cannone del consumo e della produttività. Il passo verso il compimento del fascismo, che è tutta una cosa italiana, eh, è breve. Addirittura si può parlare di congruenza dissimulata, cioè rendere impraticabile quella libertà che il linguaggio consente grazie all'ambiguità delle parole, al potere di associazione di idee che traduce, all'arricchimento poetico dei significati. Sotto le insegne del progressismo democratico, la comunicazione tecnomassiva c'è un rigurgito di oscurantismo populista, atto a cancellare gli aspetti cognitivi in favore dell'emozionalità e della disponibilità illimitata, privando l'individuo della capacità di giudizio, sia etico che estetico, e rendendolo un pedone direzionabile a piacimento. Not to forget uh, the poet Geoffrey Hill, uh, that uh, says... Uh, Why does music, why does poetry have to address us in simplified terms when it's such simplification were applied to a description of our inner selves, we would find it demeaning. I think art has a right, not an obligation, to be difficult if it, if it wishes. And uh, since people generally go on from this talk about elitism versus democracy, i would add that generally difficult art is truly democratic and that tyranny requires a simplification. Complessità come proposta anticommerciale, antiaccademica, antimeccanica. Le, de le denominazioni scrittura sperimentale e scrittura di ricerca, fatta salva al almeno in parte quella di ricerca letteraria per la sua prospettiva semantica di dinamismo, sono ormai slogan vuoti. La prima, proveniente da esperienze passate, ahimè non ancora date per acquisite, si è cristallizzata in un'idea museale, entomologica o etimologica, e l'altra nasce dal tentativo di indicare il nuovo corso della sperimentazione letteraria tramite nette esemplificazioni stilistiche e alcune più che condivisibili genealogie. Tutto ciò però sembra eh, però sempre all'insegna di, un, di una poco proficua pro, postura oppositiva contro uno status quo letterario che è certo ne necessario contrastare, ma anzitutto prendendo coscienza sia della limitatezza del punto di vista iperspecializzato sui generi, sia dell'inefficacia degli strumenti critici, ormai insufficienti a dare conto di alcune nuove esperienze di scrittura. Ad aggravare questa stagnazione interpretativa contribuisce senz'altro il, co il concetto di post. Dopo il secolo lungo degli ismi, suffisso che nell'Ottocento acquista il significato astratto di fazione o sistema dottrinario, che coincide col momento di maggiore frattura per arte e letteratura, in concomitanza con le avanguardie, c'è un'inversione di rotta a partire dagli anni 60 del Novecento. Dal suffisso si passa al prefisso, quindi ai surrealismi, dadaismi, orfismi, eccetera, si, sost eh, si sostituiscono le neoavanguardie, le transavanguardie, addirittura le post, la post-neoavanguardia, la post-poesia e infine il post-umano. L'era del post e del neo, quindi eh, della società del prefisso, mi pare sia un sintomo chiaro dell'incapacità di individuare, analizzare e accogliere quelle esperienze estetiche che si pongono al di fuori del normale e imperturbabile corso della tradizione, che non ha bisogno di altre definizioni oltre se stessa. Non solo, applicare questo concetto ad ogni sorta presun di presunta rottura, provocata da saturazione, spessimento, perdita di senso e sopravvenuta necessità di superamento, denota da un lato una rendevolezza alla propria condizione epigonale e dall'altro uno stato di perenne volontà di insediamento, la necessità di colonizzazione di un luogo che è per natura fluido e frastagliato, rischiando di oscurare quelle esperienze che stanno al di fuori del postumo. Dunque post diventa postura come instaurazione di uno status, dopodiché diventa posteggio. <ride> Ma prima... Ma prima di formulare una proposta, in ogni caso non rimandabile, visti i tempi di cui abbiamo parlato, 
per individuare un corso di nuove scritture che abbiano capacità di transito, effrazione e riorganizzazione dei codici rispetto alle convenzioni artistico-letterarie attuali, è necessario porsi una, una domanda semplicemente rovesciata rispetto al contendere degli addetti ai lavori. Dov'è che fallisce, non sbaglia, questo sia chiaro, l'arte sperimentale in senso lato? Il problema non è il predominio di un genere sull'altro, di una corrente o di un gusto, ovvero questo è uno degli effetti del problema, ma come accennato in precedenza il fuoco deve spostarsi sulla servitù volontaria degli individui. Il sistema capitalistico del consumo ha capil capillarmente deprivato la massa degli utenti della capacità cognitiva e critica sulla realtà, con sfumature diversificate che arrivano fino alla cosiddetta classe intellettuale, con un'intensificazione senza precedenti grazie all'avvento della società tecnomassiva. Del resto la carica eversiva del pensiero e lo scandalo dell'arte appaiono oggi riassorbiti quasi in tempo reale da quella che potremmo definire progressive digital sponge, eh, il sistema di or organizzazione digitale che si sviluppa indefinitamente nell'incessante accumulo di informazioni al cui cospetto i concetti di post qualcosa impallidiscono per dar corso alle declinazioni dell'iper, spazio di accelerazione dove, come sostiene il filosofo coreano Byung Chul Han, non ci accontentiamo più di consumare passivamente le informazioni, ma vogliamo produrle e comunicarle in maniera attiva. Siamo al tempo stesso consumatori e produttori. Se da un lato, sempre citando Han, la connessione digitale favorisce la, comunica la comunicazione simmetrica, e nessuna gerarchia univoca se separa il trasmittente dal ricevente, dall'altro la pervasività di, traspar di trasparenza democratica della rete produce una schiavitù spontanea a codici sempre più immediati, snelli, destratificati e depauperati. Senta senza addentrarsi in teorie del potere e complottismi, la conseguenza immediata è quella di un appiattimento, non tanto delle possibilità comunicative, quanto della complessità del linguaggio, a detrimento di una sua determinante funzione di scarto dalla norma. In un quadro del genere, gli aspetti da, della sperimentazione artistica e la ricerca di un linguaggio nuovo, fertile e non abitudinario, producono tre effetti evidenti. La spugna digitale, digital sponge, in continua espansione si appropria delle istanze radicali della ricerca e le neutralizza, filtrandone e rappresentando gli aspetti più superficiali attraverso un processo di destrutturazione che è stato proprio tipico delle avanguardie. B. Il codice adottato dalla sperimentazione è asimmetrico rispetto ai suoi fruitori, non passa comunicazione anche qualora fosse soltanto tentativo di scioccare. C. Nella democrazia digitale, chiunque è in grado di porsi all'attenzione di una platea virtuale, decretando il tramonto degli orientamenti estetici in favore di una soggettività sempre più spettacolarizzata. Detto questo, appare evidente che la maggioranza di questa società è disallineata rispetto ai codici espressivi che necessitano di un dispendio interpretativo e sono oltre la soglia statistica dell'attenzione. Questo succede comprensibilmente per la massa indistinta di consumatori, ma lo stesso comportamento affligge i fruitori di poesia e i cosiddetti lettori forti. Esiste un, un, un inventario redatto da Anna e Martino Berto del 71, e citato anche da Spatola nel libro Verso la poesia totale, riferito alla poesia sperimentale, che annovera ben 67 diverse tipologie di poesia. Eh, poesia fonetica, poesia gestuale, poesia simbiotica, poesia elettronica, poesia concreta, eccetera, eccetera, per arrivare a 67. È significativo rilevare attraverso una semplice tassonomia come in quegli anni il fermento intorno alla sperimentazione, non solo letteraria, fosse attivo e direi quasi naturale, dato per acquisito che con l'abbandono della prospettiva e l'avvento della relatività e della dodecafonia l'arte non poteva più essere la stessa. Oggi le cose sono, o almeno a me appaiono, molto cambiate, eh, sempre prima di tutto da un punto di vista so sociale. E pare ci sia un rigetto quasi eh, totale per quelle scritture che non risultano performanti a livello di consumo o di restituzione emotiva. Un rifiuto di esperire ciò che differisce dalle proprie coordinate di certezza, arrivando paradossalmente a negare, chi per gusto, chi per giudizio, lo statuto ontologico nel quale viviamo. A tal proposito credo sia opportuno aggiungere all'elenco Oberto anche la categoria di poesia dogmatica, 
come ulteriore dimostrazione di questo rigetto. È ormai ben radicato un pregiudizio matrice che assimila l'arte alla sua funzione comunicativa, quindi strutturalmente in letteratura una pagina, cornice per, ecce, per eccellenza della scrittura, redatta nella lingua di pertinenza, è esperita come un dispositivo certo in cui chi legge ripone le proprie aspettative di comprensione per ottenere un risultato somigliante se non congruente ai propri desideri, con il minor sforzo possibile, come si diceva poc'anzi. Dunque anche dalla parte della poesia, fra virgolette per così dire, c'è un processo di semplificazione che altera quella funzione differenziale dell'arte e della scrittura, necessaria a fornire un punto di vista di forme, multiforme e polivoco sulla realtà, per un raffinamento estetico che alimenti il senso critico e la formazione conseguente di individui liberi. Necessario ripeterlo per la seconda volta. In tale contesto in cui la grande massa dei consumatori non entra per motivi di algoritmo o non riesce ad entrare in contatto con fattori estetici che non siano immediatamente consumabili e dove anche i lettori di poesia ma di letteratura in generale finiscono per rispondere al solo dogma dell'ipercodificazione dei generi e dei contenuti, gli spazi che rimangono per un certo tipo di arte complessa sono assai ridotti e depotenziati. Nonostante la, spropor la sproporzione, anzi a maggior ragione in questo momento storico, in cui al grado massimo di complessità del reale corrisponde un acme retrogrado sociale e politico, la proposta eh, di una scrittura e di un'arte complesse diventa una necessità, come fattore oppositivo all'uniformazione e all'indifferenziazione che ci circondano. In altre sedi, in accenno di apertura, eh, ho cercato di delineare cosa intendessi per scrittura complessa. E mi scuso perché mi sono dilungato molto sulle premesse. Ehm, rimane un campo aperto, quello della scrittura complessa, variamente declinabile, per me preferibilmente prendendo a prestito da altre discipline alcuni concetti da rimodellare criticamente. Già il termine complessità fa riferimento alla teoria della complessità in fisica e nella scienza in generale, all'epistemologia e alla sociologia. È un concetto problema, non è un concetto soluzione, per citare Moren. Dall eh, deriva dall'aggettivo complesso, dal latino plectere, intrecciare, insieme alla preposizione cum, con. La parola complesso è quasi quindi un ossimoro, due cose tradizionalmente pensate in modo oppositivo, una pluralità di, compo di componenti, di elementi, ma anche un'unità. Fermo restando che la letteratura come le altre arti, è sempre espressione del, della società e del tempo in cui è calata e fonda spesso e spesso anticipa la visione del mondo, la scrittura complessa ha il dovere di resistere e contrastare le, la riduzione ai minimi termini dei fattori linguistici, caratteristica del quotidiano vivere ma anche della scrittura odierna. In particolare nella scrittura e nella ri sua ricezione ciò si manifesta con una dinamica di identificazione e comprensione immediate, apparentata a una forma avanzata di, di analfabetismo emotivo che non corrisponde all'ignorare per mancanza di strumenti, ma al sapere privo del sapore della conoscenza. E il giro di boa è di nuovo verso l'ignorare. Se scritture complesse si, si rinvengono in ogni epoca con aspetti e gradi diversificati, Oggi la necessità è quella di ristabilire un equilibrio, di dimostrare che la scrittura non può appartenere unicamente al dettato unilaterale della comprensibilità, della decodificazione a tutti i costi, ma deve creare un margine di indisponibilità e disappartenenza che si riverberi come pietra angolare di una struttura conoscitiva ulteriore in potenza per il suo fruitore. Per assolvere a queste funzioni e fare in modo che adempia al suo ruolo epistemologico, evadendo dalla prigione dei codici, la parola, non deve, trasformarsi in la parola de scusate, deve trasformarsi in evento, de diventando materia reversibile. Come scriveva eh, il filosofo Paul Ricoeur, la parola non deve diventare reliquia, ma deve evolversi grazie a una costante reinterpretazione. Per essere attuale, ma anche significativa, la parola deve trasformarsi in evento, in uno spazio non preordinato, non preordinato di possibilità, uno spazio aperto e multiforme. Ho individuato a questo proposito e in chiusura tre assetti descrittivi che esemplificano eh, a livello di suggestione 
eh, l'approccio complesso alle scritture, oltre a quello di sottrazione perenne a significati univoci e superstiziosi. La prima è quella che io definisco funzione disgiuntiva del linguaggio. <coughs> Se le funzioni del linguaggio organizzate da Jacobson eh, contemplano in modo esaustivo tutte le articolazioni della lingua, si può azzardare la necessità di una funzione ulteriore che va a specificare la cosiddetta funzione poetica. L'antropologo Massimo Canevacci scrive «Le, dis le disgiunzioni sono fratture dell'esperienza, le disgiunzioni sono anche fratture cognitive, qualcosa si rompe nella capacità, nelle capacità acquisite di sapersi orientare, poter classificare e elaborare modelli. Accadono strani avvolgimenti che passano tra parti diverse e contrastanti di quello che è chiamato io, l'io unificato, e che lentamente si avverte sempre più come un io striato. Con la funzione disgiuntiva del linguaggio ogni segno si ribella al suo ruolo specializzato e statico, rivendicando una produzione di senso per eccedenza, per cortocircuito, ibri ibridazione, contraddizione. Anche l'architetto Bernard Schumi si è occupato della disgiunzione, e sostituendo a quanto segue la parola architettura con letteratura si va ad ottenere un risultato secondo me significativo allo scopo. Il concetto di disgiunzione è incompatibile con, con una visione statica, autonoma e strutturale dell'architettura, leggi e letteratura. Tuttavia essa non va contro l'autonomia o contro la struttura, essa implica semplicemente operazioni costanti e meccaniche che producono sistematicamente dissociazione nello spazio e nel tempo, dove un elemento architettonico funziona esclusivamente scontrandosi con un, con un elemento programmatico, con il movimento delle masse o con qualche altra cosa. In questa maniera la disgiunzione diviene uno strumento sistematico e teorico del fare architettura. Per transitare agli ultimi due, eh, alle gli ultimi due segni che ho individuato, mh, le coordinate successive, è importante fare un breve riferimento a due concetti risultanti, secondo me, da quello mh, di disgiunzione. Il primo concetto è quello di lacuna. Eh, citando Nicola Gardini nel suo libro omonimo, Lacuna, uscito in Italia per Inaudi, eh, Nicola Gardini sostiene il non dire al fine di dire. La lacuna partecipa alla rappresentazione, è un motore essenziale della forma e del significato, addirittura la fonte del, del letterario. Non c'è omissione testuale che non rimandi a una pienezza extratestuale. Riconoscere il valore dell'omissione significa cercare il senso dell'opera. Questa ricerca strenua del senso eh, si collega direttamente all'infrasottile eh, di Duchampiana Memoria, l'inframans, una categoria sotto la quale vengono riunite tutte le sostanze, gli stati, le differenze minime, le condivisioni, i passaggi di stato al limite dell'impercettibile e dell del distinguibile. L'infrasottile indica ciò che è all'estremo della percezione, del discernibile, della differenza, ma senza essere né l'invisibile, né l'indiscernibile, né il trascendente, ma invece una presenza al limite, un possibile ma reale, o una compresenza di due stati che si sposano, dice Duchamp, eh, dando vita a un, terzo tutto, a un terzo stato tutto da cogliere. Una esemplificazione del concetto può essere lo spazio tra il rumore di uno sparo e l'apparizione di un buco sul bersaglio, ma in astratto si può affermare che la scrittura in generale, attraverso lo sfarfallio del senso e della forma, è un grande dispositivo infrasottile, che lascia dietro di sé una scia di inafferabilità, grazie Marco per la correzione, eh, per una scia di inafferabilità. Ciò provoca un atteggiamento di inseguimento eh, di un compito che si sa inesauribile, che tuttavia apre gli occhi, costringe all'osservazione, alla ricerca e alla memoria. Il punto numero, la coordinata numero due è quella dell'informe, ehm, che si riferisce eminentemente all'informe battagliano. Come ho già accennato, oggi l'arte e la scrittura sono sottoposte al meccanismo della transazione, come qualsiasi altra merce. Uno degli attributi che riesce a sottrarle alla, um, alla monetizzazione del valore è la dimensione dell'informe. Per Bataille l'informe era la categoria che permetteva di decostruire tutte le categorie. 
Bataille, allergico alla nozione di definizione, non esplicita dunque tanto il senso di informe, ma preferisce imporgli un compito, quello di negare che ogni cosa abbia una forma propria, di immaginare il senso diventare senza forma. L'obiettivo è la messa in crisi del rapporto soggetto-oggetto. Il soggetto perde la sua capacità di percezione e non ne è più l'origine. Lo spazio ne inghiotte lo sguardo abbandonandolo come oggetto tra gli oggetti dello sguardo, così da distinguere totalmente la, rigidità, la rigida integrità dell'identità individuale. Si tratta di una netta opposizione all'idealismo antropologico e a quello culturale che da esso deriva per cui la forma è ciò che un, una logica idealistica dà, in modo assolutistico, al reale, allo scopo di poterlo dominare. La desublimazione è il portato principe dell'informe, che agisce come enzima scardinante del primato della visione in favore di una viscerale coazione dei sensi, portatrice di una perdita al centro di un diffuso stato percettivo. Per eh, concludere... Ehm, Oh, eh, l'ultima coordinata la numero 3 è la paro parola continua il traguardo di questo breve escursus a carattere pulsionale è una coordinata di moto e di dinamica dato, un certo, eh, dato per certo che il sistema di rappresentazione del mondo è per lo più articolato secondo categorie antitetiche per cui nell'opposizione tra identico e differente il differente finisce per trasformarsi nell'identico è necessario proporre quella che si potrebbe definire una rivoluzione permanente della scrittura, ma che proprio oggi eh, vorrei modificare in sovversione permanente della scrittura, perché comunque la, la, la rivoluzione alla fine, anche se permanente, porta sempre a uno status quo. Nel 65 il Dick Higgins, già citato, conia il concetto di intermedia, per il quale è essenziale che scompaia ogni distinzione fra le varie forme culturali, tale che l'idea di categoria deve essere sostituita con l'idea di continuità. Ma al di là dell'esigenza di commistione, fusione e interferenza, il concetto che qui propongo di parola continua è un prelievo ancora dall'architettura, in particolare proviene dall'architettura radicale del gruppo italiano Superstudio e eh, del loro, eh, forse più celebre, eh, la loro più celebre opera che è Monumento Continuo. La parola e la scrittura si fanno paradigma radicale di un movimento metamorfico senza sosta che via via si adatta ai paesaggi che attraversa trasformandosi e trasformando il paesaggio stesso. Ciò dà luogo a una spazialità destinata a, a ospitare nuove verità slegate dalle logiche del consumo. Ne deriva una sorta di parola rinnovata nella continua oltranza del senso e della forma che instaura con quella sedimentata un rapporto dialettico di inclusione e separazione. La parola continua quindi suggerisce la necessità della memoria delle più diverse tradizioni a fronte dell'amnesia patologica della società contemporanea e prefigura incessantemente il remoto nella tensione a poli della scoperta. Concludo con le parole di Samuel Taylor Coleridge sul lettore di poesia, che mi paiono adatte sia come metafora assoluta della letteratura, sia come richiesta di eh, venia per ciò che avete ascoltato. Eh, il lettore dovrebbe essere sospinto innanzi, non già semplicemente o principalmente dall'impulso meccanico della curiosità, né da un desiderio irrequieto di arrivare allo scioglimento finale, bensì alla, dalla piacevole attività del viaggio stesso. Thank you very much. Eh, se abbiamo tempo no io volevo appunto eh, fare qualche domanda a loro però cedo <ride> lo scettro al, <ride> al discussant Devo andare lì? Mi sente professore? Eh? 
Professore, non dà segni di vita. Può andare lì. Prova. Sa, prova, prova. Sente? Sente. Professore? Sente, professore? Sì, sì, sì. Ok, sento, grazie. Sento no. male, ma sento. Ah, ok, va bene. Però percepisce, diciamo. Uh, no, quello sì, che volevo dire era magari... Forse sì, sì, no, ma il problema è il collegamento. Ah, ok. Quello che volevo dire a proposito... Eh, parli pure, la sento dall'altra parte, quindi con un po' di ritardo. Va bene, grazie. Sì, sì, sì. No, volevo Grazie. solo... Mm... Eh, male, ma sento. Ah, ok, va bene. Ecco, eh, volevo solo... Sì, sì, sento in ritardo. No, quello... Vabbè, volevo... No, ma il problema è... No, però, il dialogo è fatto... Vabbè, volevo solo puntualizzare il fatto che eh, il mio riferimento finale alla politica... Eh, non era assolutamente come dire una riproposta dell'engagement eh, stile anni 50 anzi tutt'altro cioè eh, la, non, non entro nemmeno in argomento perché mi sembra eh, evidente eh, il problema mh, però è un altro anch'io sono convinto della necessità di un manifesto caro Daniele ma di un manifesto di altro genere e, e intanto comunque il manifesto l'hai fatto tu mi sembra <ride> no volevo fare poi alcune domande a Marco Giovenale col quale mi fa piacere finalmente arrivare a una a, così a un confronto e volevo chiedere innanzitutto quanto questa relazione che è bellissima, che hai fatto, molto chiara, e che, come dire, sintetizza un po' il tuo, il tuo lavoro, sia critico che poetico, di questi anni. Mi domando quanto questa, eh, o se ha senso questa distinzione, cioè se eh, è una poetica la tua, o è una eh, poetica nel senso in cui si intendeva tempo fa, Uh, o è un una descrizione di un paesaggio? Questa è la prima domanda che ti voglio fare. La seconda riguarda... Uh, 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 I'm in English. Uh, the second one uh, is... Uh, um, uh, if it is possible to have an absolute fate on the uh, degree zero de l'écriture, uh, to the zero degree, of, for example, uh, uh, the total denotativity. It is possible uh, 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 a piece of uh, uh, a text that is totally denotative. And the third is about uh, the concept of installation. I am a little bit suspicious uh about the concept of installation because the installation is something that add himself to the world okay and so uh, i remember there is something of jameson about the concept of installation like the model of all the modern art okay and in, and so uh, these are my doubts Okay, thank you. I don't know if Francesco okay. hears us. No. Listen to me. Okay. Um, about the first question, if um, what I've said, what I've just said, is a um, poetical convention or a sort of poetics or a description of a. Of a, of a of a series of events uh, occurring in the recent um, poetry so, world, I think it's the second. So it's a description, or tries to, to be a description of a s sort of, of a paisage. Mi dispiace, ma... Vado lì. Sì, 
Francesco. Ciao Francesco, vedrai soltanto una parte di me, spero che però tu senta quello che dico. Forse no. Fabrizio told me, uh, asked me uh, something about my intervention, my talk, and asked me if uh, uh, what I said was um, a, some kind of poetics or the description of uh, a series of uh, events occurred in, in a poetry, in a recent poetry. Oh, it doesn't work, I'm sorry. But uh, what, I, what, I, what I was uh, uh, replying to Fabrizio is that, yes, it's a, some kind of description, and, uh, or, or at least a description of something that has occurred in the, the, in the recent 20 years, more or less. And um, about, uh, he, asked also, he also asked me if it is possible to have uh, an absolute faith in the, in the zero degree of, of, of writing, and uh, in a language that is purely denotative without any connot connotative uh, accent and, and, and depth. And I, and I think uh, that maybe, uh, of course, oh, maybe, I, I, I better to say, of course, it's impossible uh, not to be connotative in, in some sense. But uh, what Jean-Marie Glaise and many others are trying to do recently and not so recently is to uh, change the way, we in, in, uh, the way we look at poetry uh, in order to avoid some of the orpals and uh, Baroque uh, uh, statements and the use of syntax uh, in a certain way, and, and this is a kind of desabouflement. And uh, the, 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 it's trying to reach the integral nudity of the language. Of course, language is never completely naked. Okay. This is also, uh, of course, uh, some kind of uh, historical uh, moment uh, framed by an historical kind of uh, uh, writing. And the, and the third question regarding installation, I think that uh, it's not a category, it's only a proposal and an hypothesis. And if you, f if you look at some texts, you cannot do but just uh, turn around them, just like you do uh, turn, mm, walking around an installation. So you see it just like a, a stele, a, a, a statue. So you cannot l uh, absolutely read it from the first to the uh, for, for, from the first line to the bottom line because it's not uh, something uh, imaginative in, imagined as a narrative uh, thing but it's absolutely uh, different and it uh, conveys a kind of meaning that is uh, mainly optical and not uh, specifically uh, linguistic nor absolutely not in the sense of a, a linear linguistic uh, object so it is, uh, uh, it is, of course, something different from installation as it is conceived in the art world. But at the same time, it is maybe, I think, a metaphorical way to look at some uh, specific uh, literary objects. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much for your patience. It's very kind and uh, your reports have been very, very instructive. When we first discussed uh, this, uh, the idea of having this conversation over the, uh, uh, on Zoom many months ago, I expected some real controversy. Uh, that is to say that uh, those who proposed ricerca were going to be either won over or defeated by those who said complexity. You know? <laughs> But now listening to you, it seems to me that the bottom line is that we're all on the same boat. Uh, the point is that we, what we do may not necessarily be the same, but the expectations are the same. Yeah. And that's pretty good. You know, it's just not, uh, you don't have to co convince anybody that this is not the case. This is what we want to do. This is what we draw pleasure from. And the word pleasure, it's filtered through some of your uh, contributions seems to be crucial because most of the time people are rejecting 
uh, the type of research or complexity because they don't know how to extract pleasure from it. Now, for a long time, pleasure was condemned uh, by the Roman Catholic Church until they had to confront the problem that uh, it wasn't so bad after all. And then the humanists <laughs> had discovered that Aristotle, their own guy, was actually proposing pleasure as a stimulus towards happiness. And what do you do at that point? So what is the question? If nobody knows that drawing from the complexity of poetry or difficult reading, by the way, you should read Charles Bernstein, the attack of the difficult poem, you know, like the Mars attack. So the Mars, we also have the attack of the difficult poem. Now, the problem is that we have to be pedagogical about it. On the other hand, yesterday someone said, you know, it's also our fault as technicians of the sacred that we have withdrawn. We had let a lot of people invade the field of literature and difficult literature by, first of all, and we accepted readings that have nothing to do with literature. Literature was used to confirm opinions and ideas that were already there before reading the text. Now, it seems to me, therefore, that we have a major pedagogical problem in diffusing the notion that from experimental, difficult, uh, whatever poetry, that you can extract pleasure and pleasure leads to happiness in a very Nicomachean way, you know, in a very <laughs> Aristotelian way. But uh, otherwise, we, we don't have to spend too much time uh, be, uh, uh, discussing well, I mean, it's important to discuss differences by all means. But it seems to me that there is a bottom line, of, as I said, of expectation that makes it secondary vis-a-vis -vis the fact that we need to export. And uh, exporting means finding a language that does not repel the audience. Uh, and, and there are ways of doing that. I mean, sometimes uh, I taught my grandchild that... Uh, the uh, false accretive of burro is burrone. <laughs> and it's false because burrone has nothing to do with burro. Now, believe it or not, he enjoyed that uh, game and, and he's been pestering me for the last three years looking for falsi accrescitivi. You know, now I ran out of them. But what I'm saying is that if this can be done with a 10 year old, it can be done at a much more sophisticated level with poetry with people who come to poetry under the false assumption that poetry is, that language is there so that they can occupy, colonize has been coming up very many times, to make themselves be, which is what uh, uh, the, fol the following, the, 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 the followers, you know, you were on, on the media, the uh, 10,000 followers, 2,000 followers, uh, the Kardashians, I think they have millions of followers, uh, you know, but the same, the same, I mean, it's, it's because people uh, think that there, there's, there, there's a different kind of pleasure in following and following up to a point, not imitating. That is to say, you know, you can then take off on your own. And all this is part of a, of a pedagogical effort that, that we have to do. Uh, and uh, I'm afraid to say that academia has been very, very lax in, in, and, and guilty of relinquishing the great power that teachers have uh, and to let them uh, be colonized uh, in a way that language had been colonized before ideologically. I mean, you know, but it's not just now. Marxism is colon, or at least uh, uh, the, 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 the left has colonized language for a long time. It, even leftists had to free themselves from, from the leftist colonization of language, you know, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, it's, it's great. We have a great opportunity. Let the pheasant reappear every five days or so and spread the news. Uh, it seems to me that this can be done. It's very, uh, nobody, in certain countries anyway, you don't get jailed for doing this in other places, but we are lucky enough to be in a certainly repressive democracy here too. But with some margins, and we should just enter those margins and use them. And I think you guys have been doing a great job. So uh, I am very happy to say conclusively that instead of being 
uh, I was a little worried, you know, that we're going to tear each other apart because those who say research are not going to say complexity and, uh, and vice versa. But in fact, this is not an issue anymore. I mean, you can just follow. You, you should, what you told us, you should be telling anyone you meet. See, I have only met few people who spoke poetry all the time. Well, maybe except when they went to the post office. But Adriano Spatola and Angelo Lumelli, two people who never met uh, really each other, they don't speak any other language. They speak poetry all the time, uh, you know, they, no matter what they do. And then, of course, when they order macaroni, they, but that's it been anticipated by Breton. You know, Breton said the most incredible thing in 1924. He said, you know, for daily needs, you can use languages. Uh, you you can have it, you know, with references. But as a human being, don't forget that God gave you language to make a surrealistic use of it. <laughs> well, you don't have to be a surrealist, but you certainly can. Uh, for, uh, once again, let's not quarrel about surrealism, whether it's better than that is or not. <laughs> let's just do it, you know. And, uh, and in fact, uh, the, you know, we've, we've had many examples of poetry, but they all can be inscribed under the same aegis, the same desire, uh, and, and the same necessity. Uh, I understand we, it's, it's an uphill battle. We're probably going to lose it, but the only battles worth fighting are those that you lose. You know, <laughs> anyone's capable of fighting and winning, but losing is difficult. <laughs> Subtraction, that's the word I really love. You know, just make sure that they don't occupy, that they will do everything they can to stifle it but they won't make it. They won't. But you have to make them read what they cannot digest, and, and that's the point. And 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 that takes strategy. I mean, you know, you just every. Uh, sometimes we should actually have a a series of encounters. What does poetry do to a doctor? What does poetry do to a mathematician? What poetry does do to a logician? Uh, I know that some people didn't particularly like the fact that I invited the logician to the pheasant. I thought it was a brilliant idea, you know, because they said something I didn't know about logic. I thought logic was two and two is four. I mean, you know, but obviously there was something there. But it seems to me that there is a great uh, community of feelings about this, a great commonality. And, uh, and I think it was very interesting to hear the transition and communication are not exactly the same thing. Because don't forget that communicate, there are several uh, etymologies, several etymologies about communication, but one of them comes from munus, gift. You know, and, and I always remember those beautiful uh, Western American Indians that have one great ceremony, the pock lunch. You know, they, one tribe, Gives, makes a gift to another tribe, and the other tribe has one obligation, to return a better gift, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.